Tonight, you're gonna to see something that you've never seen on a bodybuilding show before and you may never see again. Dorian, Nasser, Pastel, Benfado, Beneziza, Monzo. Where are you going with this? I start yelling, I need doctors, I need doctors now. Beneziza died in our arms. I mean, that's how bad it was. It doesn't sound like you're supportive of that no, era I, because- well, as the years went by, the drugs got more. Were you ever connected to the mob or no? I think I could take over the sport. You stuff. can't teach this. You can't no. teach somebody how to do this. You either got it or you don't have it. What are you throwing here? What can I do for you? I said, Joe, I got these ideas. So Ben fired you. Go to the elevator, I push the button, the elevator door opens up, there's one person in there, Arnold. Why do some people not like you? Sean makes up things. They thought they were making money and we were pocketing it. Wow, two-thirds went to Weeders, no yeah. shit. I'm gonna bring Robbie Robinson to your gym. Then you're gonna put my posters up and you're gonna sell me tickets. This is the name of the contest. It's gonna be called Night of Champions. What are you talking about? Goes, Rocky 2, Night of Champions 2. Like the Super Bowl, this and that. Oh, guys, you sent me the wrong camel. Come on, Mohammed, please come out. <laughs> Please come out and talk to me, Mohammed. You still have the passion for this game. Put me on that stage there in a debate. I'll, I'll, I'll talk I, Bernie. I, I'm just <laughs> telling you. You're crazy. Go run a circus. Go to the circus. You're no longer part of the IFBB. <laughs> Let's do it. We're going to put on a show. 30 seconds. Did you ever think you were made it? Yeah. I feel I'm supposed I could take sweet victory. I know this life meant for me. Yeah, yeah. yeah, why would you bet on Goliath when we got bet David? Yeah. Value taming, giving values contagious. This world of entrepreneurs, we get no value to hate it. Now they run, homie, look what I become. I'm the, I'm the one. So today we have another one of these bodybuilding interviews, except today is slightly different. I'm not sitting with a Mr. Olympia contender or bodybuilder. I am sitting with somebody who promoted more bodybuilding competitions than anybody else in the history of bodybuilding. And someone who promoted more Mr. Olympias 18 times than anybody else. And he took over the committee of Pro League, I think, for bodybuilding Pro, in 1979, Pro Division, Pro Division Pro. which used to be Arnold. And then you took it over from 1979 to 04. So we got a complete different type of a dialogue to, uh, to, to say the least. So with that being said, my guest today, Wayne D'Amelio. Wayne, thanks for coming out. Thank you. So, so Wayne, you're watching all these interviews with these bodybuilding interviews on this entrepreneur channel called Valuetainment. What are you thinking when you're seeing some of these interviews? They're living in the past. They're let's living in the, the past. Let's get to the present. Okay. Who cares about, you know, uh, what went on in 1998, you know, at that Olympia when Chad came in with the plasma expanders. Let's, you know, here we are trying to keep the guys alive, to protect them from themselves. From 92, Beneziza died in our arms, basically. We were in Holland at the, the last show of the tour and he was pushing it. And we kept saying, you know, Momo, you know, pull back a little bit, pull back a little bit. No, 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 I gotta win them all because they were all vying for weeder contracts at that time. The show ends, and I'm told by one of the other competitors he was throwing up in the back. Well, extreme vomiting, diuretic overdose. Momo, you've been taking diuretics. Let's go to the hospital. Contest is over. You won. Let's go to the hospital. Just check it out. Let's be safe. No, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. We get on the bus. We did the contest in The Hague, and we were all staying in Middle Harness. Middle Harness is a little sailing town. We had Juliet Bergman, former Miss Olympia, lived with her husband, Jim Lensfeld, and they were co-promoters of the event. So they put us in a hotel down there, and they had a restaurant there, and we were going to have a party at the restaurant. I knew the area well because my girlfriend at the time was a Dutch girl, French-Indonesian Dutch girl. And when she got pregnant with my son, she had met Juliet at one of the contests when she was with me, and Juliet said, why stay where your mother lives, because, you know, America wasn't under my medical insurance. And she says, oh, I'll have the baby in Holland. It won't cost you a dime, as we hear about Bernie talking about all of that every, mm -hmm. every night. So I knew Middle Harness. I knew the hotel and everything, this and that. So we go back after the contest. They had a party. Momo's having trouble standing, walking. His legs are like cement. We call the doctor. Doctor comes, 
and he checks Momo, vital signs, heart, pulse, blood pressure, normal. We go, there's something wrong though. Look, he can't even walk. We think it's diuretic overdose, this and that. He goes, he's over the age of 21 and his vital signs are normal. I cannot force him to come in. Okay, two hours later, again, he's getting worse. We call the doctor again. Again, Momo don't wanna go. Now it's food poisoning, he's telling us. Okay, won't go in. About three o'clock, we all go to bed. You know, so I go down the street. They were in the hotel, I go down the street. At about 5 a.m., there's knocking on the door. Well, what's going on here? You know, I get out of bed, I'm there with Tracy, you know, and Marcellus was like three months old. And it was a bodybuilder, Al Q. Gurley. And he goes, you better come, Momo's bad. So I just throw on clothes, we run down the street. We get there, he's on the ground. He had vomited already. So I call paramedics, call the ambulance, this and that. Porter Cottrell was there, the bodybuilder on the tour. Porter was a fireman, as a porter with CPR. So I'm on one side, I'm holding his left hand, looking for a pulse. Art Bedway, one of the judges, is holding his head after we cleared his, his throat. Porter's doing CPR when they came. I felt the pulse disappear. I looked at Art and I go, he was gone. They came, they put the electric things on him, boom, 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 flat line, boom, 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 flat line. They tried to three, four times, strapped him up, took him. We're all sitting there in a daze. We knew something like this would happen because they kept pushing it, pushing it. But now it's, it's real. And then the phone call comes and the hotel person says, who's in charge? Everybody points at me, so I get the phone. And they go, please come down. Your friend has passed away. You've got to do body identification and sign the documents and this and that. Whoa. So we go. Everybody comes with me. We're all in shock. We all go to the hospital. It's like five minutes away in the next town. And I go in to see the doctor that came twice that night and the head of the hospital there. They don't have people dying in that little town. And the doctor was crying. He was a young fellow. He was crying. He goes, I don't know how this happened. I don't know how this happened. And I said to the doctor, how did it happen? He goes, obviously, whatever they were taking, your vital signs stayed normal till the moment of cardiac arrest that the body compensated. So as he had no circulation or whatever in his legs and then his arms, it was compensating until the heart went. So, okay, you know, it is what it is, but then all the things I never thought I'd have to do, you know, yeah, we had to go down. They said, you have to go down. He's in the morgue. Everybody wanted to come down. So here I got male bodybuilders. I got Juliet. I got other female athletes that were there that came to see the show. And you go down into the morgue, it's cold, the thing opens up and there's a slab and there he is laying on the slab, no shirt on with this perfect upper body, no shoes on, and just a tag on his toe. You know, some of the athletes couldn't handle it. They started crying. His training partner from France went grabbing the body, Momo, come back, come back. You know, we had a, my friend Art was there, we had to peel him out of there, get him out of there, I had to sign the documents. And there were other complications. Momo, you know, bodybuilders, well, ladies men, okay? Momo was married. He was engaged to another girl, but he was there with a 16-year-old. And she was there, this poor little girl was devastated, cute girl, cute little blonde French girl, holding on to his flip-flops, crying her eyes out. I mean, imagine what it's like for a 16, she was 16, 17 in there. She was young. And, you know, so we get her out of there. I'm saying, you know, I feel bad. I'm going to have to, this poor girl's going to go home. And then they go, uh, where are you going? I go, what? You know, I, I signed the papers. You're going to make arrangements to get the body out of here. We don't do that. You got to buy a casket. And then, you, you know, you don't think about these things. I'm a bodybuilding promoter. So here it was Sunday morning. It's now by 7 a.m. 
They helped me out because they understood the situation, how to buy a casket, how to rent a hearse, how to put, get space on the plane, cargo, to ship them back on the same flight as her to Lyon. But now I had to have a hearse, pick them up there. I had to have him set up for the body to be kept before they buried him. And I had to call the family. You know, you leave that, it's like, what, what am I involved in this for? What am I doing? What year is this? 1992. What other bodybuilders were there in the room when they came and they cried? Any uh, names or any major names or no? Um, who was on that tour in 92? Steve Brisbois was his training partner there. And he, then Brisbois opened up to me and said, you know, I had big problems Thursday night, but we kept it quiet. Sonny Schmidt was on that tour. Uh, Al Q. Gurley was on that tour. Terry Pastel was on that tour. Um, just off the top of my head. So, you know, we get rid of all of that. I come home, it was the last show of the tour. And I said to Ben Weeder, I said, you know, we gotta do diuretic testing. We gotta get back into testing. You know, I, this is not my job to go to the hospitals with people. Well, you know, this and that. They didn't really wanna get into testing. We get to the Arnold Classic, the next big show in 1993. And at the competitors meeting, I said, look, we all know what happened to Momo. I all, I, we all know that you guys are going to push the envelope. But if somebody pushes it, tell me. I mean, don't look at me as daddy that I'm going to yell at you. We want to save lives. We can't have this again. Everybody yeses me, yeses me, yeses me. You know, it's a big little contest, this and that. And the contest is over. And I go to the banquet at the Arnold that they had. Back then, they used to hold it in the basement of Vets Auditorium. And it was very loud and everything. And my son by now was uh, eight, nine months old, something like that. And he was a mellow kid, but you know, he, it was too noisy. We said, oh, let's go back. You know, In Columbus at the Doubletree, you come in on the ground floor, you go up six levels because they're all parking levels, and then there's the lobby and then there's another bank elevator. So we just come off. Who comes off the elevator is Juliet and Jim Lensfeld. And Juliet goes, you better go to Mikey's room. Mike Matarazzo. I said, why? It looks like the same thing as Momo. I look at Art, Art looks at me, saying, oh my goodness, no, no, don't say that. I said to Tracy, you know, can you take care of it? She goes, don't worry, I'll go to the room, do what you gotta do. So we go up there, I knock on the door. It's Mikey's mother, I knew Mike's mom and dad. Wayne, I'm so glad you're here, you won't listen. Now, every room was a suite, so you come into the living room. And, and he goes, Mom, okay, Mom. I sit on the bed, and I put my hand on his thigh, and it was cement. And so I go, Mikey, you're okay? You okay? You think you're okay? Come on, Mikey, get out of bed. Knock me off the bed. I said, make a multi-mineral solution, and I said, call an ambulance. No, I'm not going to the hospital. Mikey... You went too far, we gotta save you. So paramedics come and they do the same thing. Heart, pulse, blood pressure. They go to normal. Yeah, well we went through this six months ago. We did it in October, here it is March, five months ago. Mikey goes, no, I don't wanna go to the hospital. The guy goes, the paramedics go, we can't take him in, he's over 21. I said, look, a guy died and we're dealing with seconds here. Take him in. This is his mother wants him to go. This is his girlfriend wants him to go. He was dating at the time Sandy Rydell, who was a female bodybuilder. They go, we can't legally do it. And I look at Art and I go, take the keys. And the guy goes, what? Now, Art Bedway, big burly guy, he pins the guy against the wall. He rips the keys off. I said, either you work with us or get out of the way. We're commandeering the ambulance. And he goes, I'll do this, I'll do this, because they were afraid, because Art was big and I was going to get violent. I wasn't going to let Mikey die. We take him down, we get him to the hospital, we put him in there, I put his mom and his girlfriend in the ambulance, me and Art ran the four blocks to the hospital. Once we got there, we got there, they're pulling in, they're taking him out. I said, we got, he, he needs a doctor right away, we're dealing, because by now he couldn't raise his arms. We had just lived through this. We get into the emergency room, 
And I go, I start yelling, I need doctors, I need doctors now, right now, right now, I need doctors. Well, security comes, luckily it was Columbus, and they were all retired guys, and they weren't armed, and they see Art, and Art goes, you come near us, I'll hit you, you know. And five doctors come. I said, he got an overdose of diuretics, he's doing this. I said, we need IVs put in them, we need slow drip multi-mineral solution, we need slow drip of things, just muscle relaxers to relax them, this and that. So they put IVs in his legs, in his hands, in his arms, okay? Slow drip everything. They got his pulse going. It starts going down. 60, 59, 58. We're watching it. We're thinking we're going to lose him. And it gets down to about 28. It's in the 20s, and then it started coming back. He was out. His eyes are closed. It started coming back, and then it got to 60 again. And we just looked at all each other, me and the five doctors, and we just take a sigh of relief. And I sit down, and they go to me, wow, good thing you knew what to do. Doctor, where do you practice? I go, I'm not a doctor, I'm a bodybuilding promoter, and we just went through this. And I said, we're not out of the woods yet. I said, when he comes to, we've got to find out how much growth hormone he's been on, because if he doesn't have food, the growth hormone just eats, and starts eating muscle, and your heart is a muscle, and you could still go with the cardiac arrest. So one doctor said, got, got wise with me, goes, oh, you're not a doctor, what, what do you know then? I said, you know what? Take a blood test, check his metabolic rate. Go ahead, check his metabolic rate. So they take a sample of blood, and then the guy sheepishly comes back about five minutes later, can't measure it, it's off the chart. I said, by now Mikey woke up, and I said, we saved you from one thing, Mikey. Tell me how much GH you took. You could whisper it in my ear if you want. I forgot what he said. It was eight, eight or ten I used, but they don't eat, see? They don't eat, so it burns all the fat. And so I said, get all the candy bars and cupcakes from the nurse's station, get that. Mike ended up staying in the hospital another four or five days before he could go home, before he normalized. We had incidents with Flex twice on the tour with diuretics. And one time when it happened, happened in Spain, we took him to the hospital. They gave him some saline solution and everything, normalized him. They were going to send him home. I said, I don't feel secure. It's putting him on a plane from Madrid to L.A., 10, 12 hours. What if something happens over the ocean? No, he'll stay with us. So we go to Germany, and we're giving him fluids, and then he starts passing out. I was there with Kevin Lavroni, and he starts passing out. We get him back to the hotel, and I call an ambulance again. He says, Flex, we've got to take it in. And of course, he don't want to go, but we, he's got to go. We take him in there. I get the guys to the theater. You know, we're going to start judging, but you know, we'll put it back a half an hour. Everybody's worried. He was in bad shape. And I go back, and, and the doctor says to me, what is this man doing chemically? I know bodybuilders take drugs, but he goes, his left kidney is basically shut down. His right kidney is weak. I said, Flex, you got to give me a bag of goodies. We've got to know what you're on so we can do all of this. So we found out, this and that. He was in the hospital close to a week. You know, I remember I had a call. Madeline came over. He was married to Madeline at the time. He had another incident in a time on the tour. You know, we lost Andreas Munzer. Combination of things right after the San Francisco Grand Prix one. Another time at the owner class, you can find this on YouTube. Paul Dillette overdid diuretics, goes into the rear double bicep, and he locks. That's right. We took him off like a board, but by that time, we had portable IV units backstage, along with doctors, to start the IV before the ambulance got there. I mean, that's how bad it was. There was one Olympia where we had portable IV units, and I had four guys on IVs between rounds one and two. So I said to the weeders, look, we got a diuretic test. These, we got to protect them from themselves. These guys, like any athlete, is going to do anything they can to win. We all going to do whatever our profession is. We want to win. We're going to take that edge. Okay, so he gives in. So we're going to diuretic test. And we get to that meeting in New York in 98, and that's when Sean got up and said, you know, what about these plasma expanders? I don't even know what plasma expanders were. And then it's all coming out. And yeah, I mean, did I call Chad and probably threaten him? Sure. And what are you doing, though? I mean... We're all in this together. We're all like a family. When we were on the tour, if anybody said anything to anybody, foreigner, we'd all go after that person. You know, they may fight like brothers, 
But anybody go after your brother, you know, the whole family goes there. That's the way it was. Yeah, we all want the guys. Yeah, I wanted all the guys to look as good as they can, but healthy. And now you're doing something, and, you know, I think I threatened them. Well, I'm going to test all your guys for plasma. There was no test for that. I was just shooting my mouth out because I was so upset. And it's like, what are we doing? You know, bodybuilding's supposed to be, you know, the ultimate male, the extreme, you know, to look like this. You know, we all, we look at the pictures when we're teenage boys. I want to be built like this. All the girls are going to mm-hmm. love me and this and that. A lot of times these guys are the most unhealthy on stage that, and, and their life is in the balance. And it shouldn't be that. It wasn't like that before, even though they did things. I wrestled in college. And when you had to make weight, you know, they would tell you Sana. back then, you yeah. know, stop drinking water for a day and a half or some, some stupid thing like that. Okay. Yeah, and the water would come out, and you'd make weight, and then you drink water, and you're heavier. What do they do with boxing? And what do they, they have the weigh in the day before? You could put on 10 pounds, 20 pounds, if you know how to do what, whatever you're doing. Back in the old days, what did they eat? I mean, when I started running Night of Champions and all those shows, when the guys would come to New York, they'd stay at my house. This was before I had children. They'd have their tuna and water, and they'd cut down their water, and they're just having protein, and they're cutting back in this. And they looked good. You're going to tell me that the guys today look better than Robbie Robinson and Danny Padilla in the 78, 79 Night of Champions or Albert Beckles and Chris Dickerson in the early 80s? Most people would prefer those physiques because the, they had a smaller waist and everything, and they were healthy. Yeah, Wayne, let me ask you this. What's your point with starting with these stories? Because, <clears throat> you know, you're saying, Sean... Um, yeah, I mean, I, saying, you said yeah. let's not live in the past and let's, yeah. not, let's talk about what's going on today and then you went right into it. You sounded like a politician like from yesterday's debate <laughs> by the, when you started with that. But w- what is your point with starting with these stories? What, what is your outcome? Because They should drug test. Okay, so your outcome is they should, tr- they should drug they should test. Drug so, test. So are you going back to the time where you drug tested Sean Ray and he came out positive and he didn't win the Arnold class? Is, is that kind of where you're going with this? Well, what we do in IFBB Physique America, when Raphael Santoka called me up after Jimmy split and the IFBB, the parent IFBB, had no American affiliate, when he asked me to come back, I said, the only way I'm coming back, there has to be drug testing. And he said, we drug test under water. I said, well, every one of my contests will go under a random water drug test and we'll drug test the number of athletes according to how many is in there. So nobody knows if they're going to be tested. So if there's, you know, say 24 athletes in a contest, Mm -hmm. because we're building, we're small. We'll test two male, two female. Baseball, what do they test? You know, you got 26 guys on the team and they test one or two guys out of the 26. That's all they test. You know, of course there's 162 games and we have maybe 20 contests. But at least we're drug testing and people know we're drug testing and if you get caught, according to the IFBB rules, you're suspended for four years. Who chooses who gets drug tested? It's done by random. How, how do you do that? What's the approach? We may take an independent person and put all the numbers down and say, these are going to be the male numbers, these are going to be the female numbers. Pick two of each. Is it done privately or publicly? In front of the athletes. Oh, okay. You do this in front of the athletes. Yeah. Oh, it's very firm. Okay. Yeah, got no. it. So it's not like, because like, no. you know, sometimes politically behind oh, yeah, closed no, it's kind of like, you picked on yeah, me I'm going to pick on this yeah, guy. Yeah. Okay. I get it. So that's yeah. fair to do yeah, it that no, way. No, it's got to be fair. Assuming you do it that way, that's very fair. Yeah. Okay. And, and, you know, we'd send it to a lab, a water lab, or they do the water test or whatever the heck the thing is. I mean, there's a lot of things on a, on a, tests that we don't need to do. We haven't had any problems of diuretic overdose, anybody cramping on stage that they had to come off. We also had these guys, we'd have a, you know, oxygen thing for them while on the side when they needed oxygen. Come on. So you didn't like that era. It doesn't sound like you're supportive of that era no, I, because... Well, w- w- as, as the years went by, the drugs got more. And I kept saying, you got to remember my relationship with the weeders, and this is another thing Sean didn't understand. I know he made the comment because people called me and said, the weeders were paying you money? I said, no, I was paying them. I was, what, what, what it, after I was appointed to the position, then eventually I started a company, IFBB Pro Division Inc. My company, I pay taxes, it wasn't a federation. The IFBB recognized me to run pro bodybuilding. It was my company. So, yeah, if I acted like a dictator at times, like Sean said, yes, I did. Because it was my company and you cannot do what you want. You're an independent contractor. You can join my company of your own free will or you could join any other pro 
bodybuilding organization out there. It was your choice because I was giving away more prize money than anybody else. I was taking care of the athletes better than everybody else by flying them in, taking care of their hotels, food allowance. But you had to adhere to the rules. You had to do press conferences, like anything. Boxing, okay? We just saw a championship fight. Those guys had to do press conferences. They had to do all sorts of publicity because the promoters are putting up the money and you are the stars and you got to help generate the money. Nobody cares about Bob Arum. Nobody's paying money to see Bob Arum. No one is. Yeah, but they're paying to see the boxers and you got to create that hype where you're watching them and they're bad mouthing each other and they get you excited that I'm going to put down that Whatever 90 amount. bucks, 100 bucks. Yeah. Would you consider yourself a promoter? Would you say you're a promoter? Well, I mean, by yeah, nature, you're a promoter. Yeah. Okay. So, but by the way, you sound like you, you had, you know, you know, you, you sound like some of my other guests that I've had here, like mob affiliation. Did you have any mob connections back in the days or no? Because to, to be able to do that, you got to have a strong personality to handle other Let's ego people. Like Dana um, White, I'll give you an example. Dana White's a promoter. You, Dana is not scared of a lot of people because Dana, Dana's coming from the streets where he's a tough guy to handle the guys that are UFC guys you got to be a tough guy. To be a Don King, you can't be scared of people. I know people oh, that were... Of people. What I'm saying to you is, you kind of come across as that kind of a DNA. How did you become who you, are, who you were when you started promoting? Like, who was Wayne before he became the guy that's, you I've know... I've always been this. I've always been... When I played on baseball teams, softball teams, I was always the, the captain, the coach, the this or that, the player coach. I we was always, always pushing in, buttons or no? Yeah. I was always in, in a leadership position. I'm a typical Leo, born in August. Okay. okay, got it. Um, Were you ever, ever connected to the mob or no? No, but they used to come to the shows. Oh, to the shows as guests. Yeah, they yeah. used to come to the shows. Any big names or no? Yeah. Who? I don't say. Okay. Anybody that's been a guest on my show? No, he didn't. Okay, got it. No, but his, his father's son. <laughs> uh, you know, okay, his boss's, got You know yeah. who I'm talking about. I got okay. it, yes. Yeah, he was big into bodybuilding. A lot of them were. Yeah. And a lot of them are friends of mine. He just passed away, by the way. Who? Junior? No, no. Oh, no, no, I'm not talking about that guy that was 103. Oh, you're not talking about him? No, no, Gotti Jr. Oh, used to come I got to it, okay, guy. I got it, okay. Yeah. But a lot of the guys, you know, in Brooklyn back then in the late 70s, early 80s. They were into it. Yeah, they were into training. They'd come to the shows and this and that. I didn't have no problem, you know. Would you consider yourself a tough guy or no? No, I, a reasonable guy. But I have Reason- to be tough. I have to be tough when I have to be tough. No, I get, again, going back to it. Are, like I said, you, you know what? You get my face, I'll be right back in yours. So what I'm saying is, how did you become that? Who were you around? Who, who pushed you around where you had to be tough? Like, how did you become the way you are? I always was. You grew up in the streets of New York? Are you, are yeah. you, where'd, you, where'd you grow up yeah. at? I grew up in New York. You grew up in New York? Yeah. And in high school, you were the leader in high school? Were you the guy that played um, sports, the cool guy, the ladies guy? Who were you? I went to an all-boys school. I went to Brooklyn Tech for smart guys. It's tough to be a ladies guy. In yeah, tough boys. to be a ladies guy. <laughs> Brooklyn <laughs> Tech never had a prom. <laughs> you know, every year they try to have a prom, they are they going to have a prom? <laughs> okay, so what do you do after high school? After high school, I went to college. And what are you trying to be at this point? Are you trying uh, to be... I was, got a degree in engineering. Okay. And then I got a job at a college with AT&T. But I had taken an elective in college in political science, in constitutional law, and it fascinated me. So I decided to go back to college because AT&T would pay for it. And I was saying, ah, maybe I'll become a lawyer. I can see Went that. Went to take political science, and I took communications, but communications meaning debating, persuasion, argumentation, to be an attorney or a politician. I got those degrees, but I went to a bodybuilding show. What year? 1973. I wanted to go, there was two shows held, because bodybuilding world, they always do stupid things. Dan Lurie used to be part of the IFBB. He even said that he started the IFBB, his son has incorporation papers, said he started the IFBB in 1948, he incorporated, Ben Weider says he started in 1946. Who knows? They were at odds. So Dan had the WBBG, the Weeders had the IFBB. They put the shows on the same day, to try and kill each other. Dan goes and gets, as a special guest, Steve Reeves. Now, I had seen Steve Reeves when I was 10, 11 years old in those Hercules movies. I wanted to go buy a ticket to see it. Because now I was working, I had money, I could buy a ticket. Because when I was young as a teenager, Mr. America, AAU Mr. America, was always held in York, Pennsylvania. I was 13, 14, my mother said, where are you going? You're not going to York, Pennsylvania on a bus by yourself at 13. You know, it's like, 
never went. I got out of bodybuilding for a while. I was into boxing. I boxed for five, five Did years. You, so were you bodybuilding? I, I trained. I never competed. Okay, got and, it. You know, when I found out about the drugs, I wouldn't take drugs. Why not? It harmed your body. It was, it was defeating the purpose. After that contest in 73, where Arnold won the Olympia, because I couldn't see Steve Reeves, so I went to the IFBB show. I said, I'll see this fella Arnold. Because I was reading the Mac, it was at the bodybuilding 66, 67, when Arnold first came on the scene in the NABBA universe. But then I got into boxing and I stopped bodybuilding. I was just total boxing. And then I got back into it late 72 again. A friend of mine had a magazine. I said, oh, I remember this guy Arnold with the funny last name. He said, he goes, he's the greatest bodybuilder in the world. He's Mr. Olympia, this and that. So I look at the thing, it was late 72, which said the contest was gonna be 73. I looked at the other thing, there's Steve Reeves, but I couldn't go to Steve Reeves, so I bought a ticket to Brooklyn Academy to see Arnold. And Arnold wins that night, and they give him the check, and he takes the microphone from the podium, and back then everything had a wire, there weren't wires, and he's pacing on the stage, looking at the check, and I'm thinking, what is this guy doing, you know? And then he just stops and he goes, I train all year. I train all year. Last year they gave me $1,000. This year, 750 And he throws the mic on the floor and walks off. I go, wow, what a wild sport. This is entertaining. Why isn't this place sold out? So I joined the gym, Mid-City Gym, that promoted the show. And I meet the guy that was the promoter, Tom Minicello. And he was the IFBB vice president at the time. And so I joined the gym and I said, oh, Tom, you know, I went to the contest Saturday. Wow, Arnold, Arnold's a character. Yeah, that's Arnold being Arnold. I said, well, why didn't you have any big sponsors? And he goes to me, well, when big companies are ready to sponsor bodybuilding, they'll come to me because I run the Olympia, the big show. And I go, but Tom, nobody comes to give you money. You gotta go out and get it. No, no, you're too aggressive, you're young, you'll learn. Stay back, you wait, and people come to you. And I walked out of that room thinking, if this is the guy that's in charge of the Olympia and the vice president, and this is his way of thinking, I think I could take over the sport. I mean, that, that was the thought in my head. In that moment? In that moment. Huh. So I became friends with Tom, and I said, you know, anything you need, because I was still living home with my parents in Richmond Hill, Queens, by JFK Airport, you know. So he goes, you know what? You could be my gopher. Anybody that comes in, instead of me having to pay for a taxi, you could go pick them up and bring them in. I said, okay. So that's what I would do. So I got to know everybody. The only guy that didn't come in that I, I had to pick up was Arnold. Arnold demanded a limo or whatever. I got to meet Arnold later on in 73. He came back to New York to do something. He's training, came in at lunchtime, and he was in the locker next to me. He said, hey, I go, hi, I saw you in the thing. Oh, yes, blah, blah, blah. And we just told, what's your name? My name's Wayne, and we shook hands and this and that. And we trained a little bit together, this and that. And just two guys, you know. I wasn't a groupie, you know. And I think he enjoyed that, you know, because other guys, well, you know, oh, that's Arnold, you know, this and that. No, he's just another guy. And, you know, we struck that up. In 74, I helped Tom. He ran the Eastern America in the spring and the Mr. America, uh, the Mr. Olympia in the fall. And I helped him with everything, this and that, for free. I bought my tickets, but I did a lot of work. And I was starting to go around. I'd go around to contests, no matter what the federation was, buy tickets, and then offer my help backstage just to see what they were doing wrong, not what they were doing right, because they would... I'm thinking, like, why aren't these shows run better? What's wrong here? In January of 75, Tom goes to me, I'm going to make you the Metropolitan Director of the, I of the AABA, which was the American affiliate to the IFBB, because they hadn't affiliated with the AAU NPC yet. You can run the Eastern America contest this year. I said, wow, Tom, thanks. I go into the gym, all the guys that I'd see at train at lunchtime, I said, guys, guys, Tom's going to let me run the Eastern America this year. And they go, ha, 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 they're laughing at me. I go, what's so funny? He goes, if he don't run that show, then we've got a show in the spring and then the show in the fall. We'll go to the AAU, and he'll have no, no amateurs for the fall show. So now you're going to lose the money instead of him. And he's still going to get us in the fall. I said, I'm not going to lose money. They go, what do you mean? I said, I'm going to get a sponsor to cover my expenses. They looked at me, what's a sponsor? I said, it's a company that gives you money in exchange for exposure. They're looking at me. Now, I'm 25 years old. I said, oh, I'm going to figure out my expenses. So one of the guys that trained there was an assistant principal of a school around the corner. And he just come to me, he goes, Wayne, you want to use our school? It's not that big. But he says, you know, there was only like 
30 people in the audience at the Eastern America last year, so we've got 200 seats. It's plenty big enough. I said, okay, let me go see it. We do it. He says, I'll get it for you for free. All you got to do is throw 50 bucks to the custodian to come in on a Saturday. I said, okay. Make sure the lighting was good because I understood lighting a little bit. Of course. You know. yeah. And so I figured out my budget, trophies, printing, whatever. You know, we put posters up. And my budget was $600. So a friend of mine worked at JFK part-time in a hotel reservation company. It was a husband and wife reservation company. So if you came off a plane and you didn't know where to stay that night, you go to them, they'd book you in a hotel and they get the commission. And I said to them, look, you give me $600. Everybody that comes in from this show will book a hotel room through you. It was an amateur show, they had a book. But then they'll know about your company because of all the publicity Anything beyond that is gravy. So we're going to break even here because you'll make enough money. And then this and that because, like, all the guys coming in from California, you know, the weeder, you know, photographers and this and that. Have, have you yet met the weeders or not yet? Yeah, I had met the weeders. I met, I met them at, at the show in 74. I just said hello to them. Oh, but not a real sit-down conversation, no, no. nothing yet. No, they don't really yet. know who you are and what your aspirations no, are. No, okay. no. I got my thing covered. I had met Gene Mose. Gene Mose at the time was the editor of Muscle Builder. Unfortunately, Gene has passed away too. And I said to him, I'm going to run the Eastern America. I called him up at the Weeder Building. And I said, can you give me an ad? He said, well, I could give you a half a column ad. I'll run it for two months. Okay. So I had an ad in Muscle Builder for the contest. I didn't uh, know the concept yet of going around to other gyms and everything. But I knew Mid-City Gym had to have about 500 members, so I got on every one of them. You get your tickets yet for the Eastern America? You get your ticket? Guys would say, wait, here. Here's my $5. Give me the stupid ticket. Leave me alone. Let me train. Then I would go all hours of the day because I was at lunchtime, but guys that trained at night with different guys on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It was only open on Saturday. It wasn't open on Sundays and stuff. I sold the 200 tickets in advance. Reserve in the front with chairs with an arm was $6.50. Folding chairs behind them were $5, and then, <laughs> you know, standing room was $5. So I made over $1,000. Got to remember, I was working for AT&T, making about $140 a week, and here I am making $1,200, $1,500. I, was, I knew I was going to make money, so I even bought a TV set for the winner, you know. I figured, I don't know what to do, you know, making all this money, I'll buy something else besides all the trophies. So I go in Monday morning, everybody's telling me how great I am Saturday night, you know, it was a fun time seeing all the guys from the gym and, you know, seeing the guys, all these guys come in businessmen of suits. Now they're coming in, you know, the way they hang out on a weekend. And, okay, so I go in on Monday morning, go train at lunchtime, and Tom goes, get in my office. I go in, I said, what's up, Tom? You have a good time. That was the worst contest I ever saw. This was bad. He reams me out. I leave there and I'm in my mind. I'm in a daze. I'm saying, wow, what went wrong? So I go in the gym and everybody's patting me on the back and this and that. I said, why is Tom yelling at me? Saying it was the worst contest ever. And the guy that was the principal, you know, who just came in to train and this educated guy, he goes, Wayne, do you understand what happened? I said, no. He goes, he's jealous. You did what he can't do. He's lost money on that show, and you've made, you know, you didn't hide it. You said you made, you know, over $1,000, close to $1,500. And he's jealous, and he knows you're better, and he, he doesn't like you no more. I said, but I'm running it under him. I'm running it for his federation. And they go, welcome to the business world, the real business world, the cutthroat business world. When you're very successful, some people don't like you. They're jealous of you and this and that. Okay. By the time we got to the fall show, you know, he didn't want me involved with it that much and this and that. But what he did was he had pictures up on the wall that my girlfriend at the time took. She eventually became my first wife. And he used some of these pictures on the poster. I know what laws are. So I said to him, I'm still training at the gym because I paid every month. He wanted my money. I said, you know, Tom, you're using Karen's pictures. Well, well, they're on my wall. They're mine. No, they're hard. They're stamped. You could put them on the wall, but you're using them for advertising purposes. Now, you got to remember, back then, prejudging wasn't open to the public. I don't know why. That was another thing I'm saying. You're throwing money away. But 
that's the way they thought back then. And I said, and only select people could be at the judging along with the judges. Yeah. So I said, uh, you know, can me and Karen come and take pictures and this and that? Well, I'll think about it. Now, he had a partner. We're going to go to the thing. And I had met Joe Weider by the fall of 75. What happened in the summer of 75, I had been writing letters to Joe Weider. I didn't really know if there was a difference between Joe and Ben, you know, these guys. At all? You don't know yet? Yeah. I decide, I'm just going to go. So I get an airline ticket. I get on a plane. I rent a car. I look on the map, Woodland Hills. I go to Irwin Street, 21100 Irwin Street. So I just go one way or the other till I meet that number. Wow, here's the Weeder building. I was impressed. This beautiful, big building. This is bodybuilding? Wow. So I walk in. And they had these big paintings on each wall, about, oh, 10, 12 foot. Larry Scott, Arnold, Franco, all the guys, these big paintings that you walk in. And I go, I'd like to see Joe Weider. Is he at this point making money? Joe? Joe. Oh, of course, yeah. What kind of money is he making at this point? Is it real money or not yet? Oh, it's real money. It's real money? Yeah. Okay. Because you know the story about Arnold, how he talks about it in the book Total Recall. He says, the first time I went out there to visit Joe... It was a little uh, shack. It wasn't like a big headquarters they had. So this, no. is, in, this is at the point No, this where, is the major building. Okay, this got is it. the major 1975 building. 1975 or 76? 75. 75, summer 75. 75. Okay. Woodland Hills. Urban. Woodland Hills. Yep. I said, well, talk to Gene Mose. He knows me. Tell him Wayne from New York is here. So Gene comes down. Hey, Wayne, you know this. And I said, I want to see Joe. I, want to, I got these ideas. And he goes, okay, come on up. So he introduces me to Annalise, Joe's secretary. She goes, you got no appointment. I said, no, I came from New York. I want to see Joe. Well, sit here. It was like 10 o'clock in the morning. I sat there till 6 o'clock. Every time she'd look out, you're still here? I said, I'm still here. So finally, she goes, he'll see you. And Joe, what, what, what are you doing here? What, are you, what can I do for you? I said, Joe, I said, I ran the Eastern America contest last year. Tom got all upset and this and that. I said, but I want to run pro shows. All you got is Mr. Olympia. And, you know, those are the stars. And without the stars, it's boring. I said, so I think bodybuilding should be like golf and tennis, where there's Grand Prix things, and you get points for the shows, and this and that. I had all these ideas. He looks at me and goes, oh, that'll never work. But it's not me you got to talk. You got to talk to my brother. Your brother? Ben, he's the head of the IFBB. I just run the magazines. I don't do nothing. Yeah. (laughs) That's the both. Was he telling the truth? Well, he did run the magazines, but he was Ben's big brother. He would always tell Ben what to do. You know? So he is just pawning you to Ben right now, yeah, but yeah. the final decision is going to be still him. Well, it's going to, now, to be part of the IFBB, it's going to be Ben, but, you know, they would always play good cop, bad cop. Got it. You know, so I'm saying I came out here for not, oh, this and that. Of course, four months later, I see Joe's editorial. We've got to take pro bodybuilding and make it this, this, and this, you know, Grand Prix. I'm saying that's just what I told him, right? So... I start writing, you know, you got to remember, this is before email. It wasn't even fax machines. You had to write letters. So I write letters to Ben Weider. I'd like to come up and see you and this and that. I get nowhere. Other people that I was helping or bodybuilding, I said, write a letter to this guy. Now, we get to the 75 show in New York. Mr. Olympia was being held in South Africa, pumping iron, Pretoria. I'm there, and... The night before, everybody's in town, because I'm still picking up the guy, because now the guys don't even go to Tom. They can just call me up. Wayne, can you pick me up? My flight's coming in at this time. So I bring them in, and I see Joe at Tom's gym, and he goes, oh, come get me. I don't want to take a cab. Joe was a little cheap. Pick me up and take me, because it was being held at the old Fells Forum part of Madison Square Garden. I said, okay. So I pick up Joe. Now, I had said to Tom, you know, we may be able to get him prejudging, right? Well, I got to talk to my partner, Pete. Yeah, I don't think there's a problem. Okay, so we get to the felt forum. Now, they had New York City cops there. My dad, former president of the PBA, Patrolman's Benevolent Association in New York. At that time in 75, he was the vice president. He was known. So we get there, and I said, uh, you know, to go in through the back door, and we come with Joe. And, and they go, what's your name? I said, uh, her name is Karen Clark. This is Joe Weider. I'm Wayne D'Amelia. Says he goes, well, Joe Weeder's on here. I don't see Karen Clark. He, so Joe goes, oh, she's with me, taking pictures for me. So the guy goes, okay. So the guy goes to me, you know Sam D'Amelia? I said, that's my dad. I said, he's your vice president of the PBA. So we are talking and this and that. And the next thing, Joe comes, what the heck is going on in there? They're throwing Karen out. I said, what do you mean they're throwing Karen out? Karen comes out. She goes, 
Tom's partner, Pete, doesn't want me in there. I said, but he's using your pictures. Those are your pictures on the poster. He didn't pay you a dime. That's technically against the law. I go to Joe, you go in there and you tell Tom, if he don't let us into the judging, I'm going to sue him. Tom comes out all shaking. You're going to sue me? You're going to sue me? Clean out your locker. Get out of Mid-City Gym. You're out of here and this and that. I said, fine. I leave. Joe's going, where are you going? Where are you going? I said, I don't need this. You're coming back tonight, right? No, I'm not. You think I'm going to give him any more money and buy a ticket? I'll buy it for you. And he did. He bought us two tickets. And, and he's he cheap. Bought, he's yeah, cheap and he bought it. Yeah. I was way in the back in the cheap seats, but he took Karen up front to take pictures for him because he liked her pictures. I went back to my locker, Mid-City Gym. I took the thing. They go, Wayne, what are you doing here? I said, I'm out of here. I told them the guys in the gym, you're quitting? I said, yep, I ain't going to deal with this no more. You know? I said, he can't handle it. I said, Tom's a nice guy. He's laid back. You can't be nice as a promoter. You got to push, 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 push every day. That's how my brain goes. And I said, you know, I want to do bigger things. Yeah, I was in the back, and you know, I went out with Joe Weider and the guys that night, not Tom. Tom wasn't with them. I'm with all the guys and everything. And I continue to write. I said, you got to talk to your brother. Where's your brother? Ben was there, and then Ben took off. You know, Ben didn't hang out with the bodybuilders. Joe did. And I said, you got to talk to your brother. I'll keep on him. Keep on him. So I write and write and write, and finally I call. And I get a secretary, Pamela Kagan, on the line. And I said, hi, uh... I've been writing. She goes, are you the guy from New York with all these letters and you get all these people writing? I said, yes. I want to come up there and speak to him. I got these ideas and Joe said I should speak to him. So they go, okay. The world champions, now the whole year went by. We're talking now to fall of 76 and I'm still going around to amateur shows learning. World championships in Congress was going to be held in Montreal. He said, she said to me, I'll put you down for a time with President Weider. It was like seeing the Pope. I remember the time. I had a Thursday afternoon, 2.10 to 2.20. So I check into the hotel. You're going to be in. And I get there early, and there's all these people lined up. I'm thinking, like, wow, how, how do you do this? Like a doctor's off here. Pick a number. What are you? So I see this lady there, and she has a pad and everything. I said, are, are you Miss Kagan? She goes, yeah. She goes, uh, you're the guy from New York, Wayne. I could tell by the way you speak. I said, yeah. She goes, 2.10. You're behind this guy. <laughs> right? And this and that. Okay. So my time comes. I go into this room. Ben had this big opulent suite. And you go in, and there's a chair there, just like a little folding chair. And there was three steps up, and Ben was in this big armchair like the king. I felt, I felt like I was seeing the Pope. And she goes, Mr. Weeder, this is Wayne D'Amelia from New York, who's been writing us for the past year. So he looks at me, and he goes, well, okay, you got your time. What do you want to do? I said, I want to run pro shows. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Ba, 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 ba. He looks at me. Do you compete? No, sir. Do you own a gym? No, sir. I work, work for AT&T. Do you even work out? I said, Mr. Weeder, you're skittier than me, and you're the president of this thing. If I was in the gym competing all day, taking drugs, how could I be a promoter? And he laughed. And he goes, typical Ben. Ben was a politician. I learned a lot from Ben. We fight all the time. As years went on, we fight constantly. It was one of the reasons why I left. I just had enough. But I learned a lot from him. I give him a lot of credit on a lot of things. He goes, well, you know, Joe got the idea for a pro committee. And only those people on the pro committee could run contests. And we're going to start the pro committee tonight. So if the chairman of the pro committee wants to put you on it, you could be on it. I said, okay, who's the chairman? Our greatest champion, Arnold Schwarzenegger. I said, okay, okay. I said, well, I met Arnold in the gym three years ago, and I said, I'm good friends with George Butler, and I'm an independent, unpaid consultant on Pumping Iron, and whenever they have screenings in New York, I go to it, and half the time Arnold's there, and we're goofing around. So you and Arnold are getting along at this oh, point. Oh, yeah. There's a relationship. Yeah. Okay. So he goes, well, if he wants to put you on a committee, it's fine with me. I said, oh, thank you. I shake his hand, leave, say goodbye to Mrs. Kagan, this and that. No lie. I go to the elevator, I push the button, the elevator door opens up, there's one person in there, Arnold. I think to myself in that one split second, this is meant to be. I go, Arnold, you're starting a pro committee tonight, I want to be on it. Ah, Vane, okay, come to my room, 7 o'clock. There's my room number. Okay. So I go there, the original committee, Jim Lorimer was there, 
I had met Jim Lorimer at a contest the year before. There was supposed to be another AABA contest in 1975. And the promoter had four guest posers. He was going to have Arnold, Franco, Louis, and Chuck Sipes. 1975, all big names. But he forgot to do one thing. Sell tickets and get a- amateur athletes in the show. The only athletes were the guys that came with me from Mid-City Gym. And he sold two rows of tickets, but he double sold the first row and the guys were fighting and Arnold goes, I have a friend here in Columbus that could help out. And he calls Jim Lorman. That's how I met Jim mm, Lorman, 1975. Yeah. And me and Jim always hit it off. I'm saying, can you believe this guy sells the whole place? There's 4,000 seats in here and he sells the first row twice. That's the only people he had. So Jim Lorman was on that committee and it was John Balick was on that committee from Iron Man and this and that. But I'm looking at the guys, I'm saying, I already got a tentative date on a venue in New York for the spring of 78. I figured I'm going to do a spring show. Again, going back a little bit, that Monday after the first show I ran in 75 when Tom read me out, I saw, you know, all the guys in the gym were talking. So I see another guy there that I'd see every day. And I go, oh, what did you think of the contest? He goes, oh, I, didn't, I couldn't make it. My, I got a flat and I never got there. I said, really? He goes, yeah. I said, you got your tickets? He goes, yeah. He said, I bought reserve. I said, here, here's $13. Give me the tickets. I gave him a refund. So he goes, uh, I see you here every day. He said, who did your ad? I said, I did. You know, copy thing. He said, it's terrible. It sucks. I said, really? It's just like the ads in the magazine. He says, well, the ads in the muscle magazine don't know what to do. He gives me his card. He says, after we train today, come on up to my office. I'm the vice president of on-air design for NBC. So I go up there and we talk. And I said, I tell you what. Let's be partners. I got all these ideas, staging and everything, but I can't do all this artwork. I'm not an artist. You do the ads. I come up with crazy ideas for staging because look at the stages, black curtain and a thing. No, it's got to be staging. We got to do this. We got to do that. And you do that. And I take care of the money. I sell the tickets, this and that. We split 50-50. He goes, fine. We shake. You never had a contract. I said to him, I'm going to go up there and get the rights. He'd laugh at me. He goes, okay, whatever. Charlie was a little older than me. Charlie's still alive. (laughs) And he'd go, okay, you know, you go go ahead, do your thing. So I come back to the room after saying I'm going to see Arnold that night. I say, yeah, I'm going to be on the committee. Only people on the committee can run it. I'll let you know who's on the committee after I go there tonight. And I looked around. I'm saying, maybe Arnold and Jim Lorem are going to do it because they're going to run the Olympia here. They just ran the Olympia in 76, and they're running it again. But nobody else in that room is going to run a show. And I got the date set. So when I got back and everything, wrote a letter to Ben Weeder, and I said, uh, how do I go about locking in my show? I'm going to do a show in the spring of 78. I need 18, I figured I needed a year and a half. I couldn't do it that quick from November to May. I never run a, sh- a big show that I wanted to do, prize money and this and that. got to remember, the prize money in the 1977 Mr. Olympia was only Twelve, five, or fifteen thousand dollar total, and I was going to give away ten. And there wasn't many sponsors for big shows. I figured I'm going to sell every seat. I will sell every seat. I don't care what. At sixteen fifty or at, oh, at no, no, six fifty? Oh at... no, no. Now I'm doing a pro show. The judging was five dollars. Well, now I'm going to first show that the judging was open to the public. How many showed up? Oh, I had over a thousand people at five bucks. Yeah. Okay, so you made, this is in 1978, uh, yeah. September? And or? In, uh, in May of 78. And yeah. the finals I sold for 10, 12, and 15. I was sold out before I went in. And then, you know, you talk to the theater manager and they'll do standing room half and half because it's all cash. I did well. We made money. We made about mm, seven, 8,000 profit on that first show, which was a lot back then, you know. Thirty-five hundred, four thousand dollars a piece. Me and Charlie. Are you still working at AT and T or no yeah. more? Oh yeah. Oh, you're still working at oh, AT and T. Oh yeah, I've been working full time full-time job. Yeah. How long were you at AT and T? Until nineteen eighty-five, eighty-six. Oh, so, oh, okay. So yeah. you did all this stuff while yeah. you're still working full time at AT and T. Yeah. Okay. Got. It. Yeah. And I, are I you was, are you married still or no? You're not married. I got married anymore. in seventy-seven. So by the time this show in seventy-eight, I was yeah. married to Karen at the time, and. Running the show and yeah. working for AT and T, I just bought a house, this and that, and then the guys would come stay in my house. I bought a big house for the bodybuilders to stay in my house. Now 
the interesting story about that 78 show. I go around earlier in 77, late in 77, Dan Lurie ran a contest and he advertises Arnold versus Sergio. Everybody wanted to see that again. And they were saying, he put down invited to compete. But it was in very small print. Everybody saw the pictures, Arnold and Sergio. Everybody bought tickets. Sergio showed up, Arnold wasn't gonna show up because he was under the IFBB and they said you're not allowed to go into a non-sanctioned event. Sound familiar? You know, so he didn't show. All the gyms that sold tickets for Dan Lurie, all the fans were yelling at the gym owner and everything, you know, I want my money back. I went to buy Arnold versus Sergio, he wasn't there. So here I come in January 78, and I got a poster, the, the biggest star in the sport at that time was Robbie. Robbie came on the scene, the black prince, the afro, the, the vest all shredded up, you know, those lats coming out, this and that. Danny Padilla, Boyaco had joined the IFBB two years before from being in other things. I got them all on this poster, beautiful poster with overlays and mezzotints. Charlie did it, of course. It was better, you know, when we did an ad, like the first poster, Joe Weider goes, who did this ad? He called me up. Who did this ad? It's better than any ad in here. You're making me look bad. I said, my partner, Charlie, I want to talk to him. I want to hire him. Later on that year, when we had the universe in 78 in Acapulco, he goes to Charlie, you know, I want to hire you. Charlie goes, well, you got to pay me more than NBC. He goes, well, what are they paying you? This is 1978. Charlie was a vice president. He goes, I'm getting paid 80 grand plus other things. And Joe goes, what? <laughs> you know, Joe was freaking out. How could anybody pay anybody like that? You know, Charlie was, Charlie would run the affiliates convention. Is Joe a millionaire? At that time. Yeah, but Joe was cheap. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I go to the gym in Bath Beach Gym in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn in 1978. Everybody was John Travolta in the gym. The black slick back hair, the white t-shirt with their pack of cigarettes under the arm. Just right out of the movie. I come in. I'm going to go to that gym because that's the big hot gym. And I go in there, and I go, hi, you're the owner? He goes, yeah. Who are you? I said, hi, my name's Wayne, and I'm going to be running a show in May, and I'd like you to put up my poster and sell tickets for me. He looks at the thing. That's Robbie Robinson. I said, yeah, he's a friend of mine. Who the heck are you? I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm just I'm a promoter. I'm a, I just sold tickets for Dan Lurie. We all know who Dan Lurie is. Look, his, his name is on every one of the plates in my gym. You know, because Dan Lurie made barbells. And he said he was going to have Arnold and Sergio, and Arnold don't show up, and everybody wanted money back. And now you come in here, you're going to bring in Robbie Robinson and Danny Padilla and Boyer Co. Get out of here, he goes to me. I said, no, they're going to come. And this guy comes here, and this guy comes here. Cameron goes, I think it's going to be a hit. I go, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what. I look at him like this. I take out my wallet. I said, here, it's my driver's license. It's got my address on it. He goes, yeah. I said, see this phone number on here? Because Ticketmaster didn't exist yet. This is how far back we're going. Ticket, no, no Ticketmaster. Either the last three weeks at the box office or else by mail order, if you wanted information, that was the phone number in my wow, kitchen. Wow, okay? yeah. And that's, that's my home phone number. Give me that calendar. And he looked at me. I said, give me the calendar off the wall. Well, now he's backing up a little because I'm getting aggressive. May 6th, Saturday, May 6th, the contest. Monday here, the first. We go back this day in April, this day in April. 8 p.m., Robbie Robinson. I'm going to bring Robbie Robinson to your gym three weeks approximately three weeks before the show, but when I do, then you're going to put my posters up and you're going to sell me tickets. Copy down my address. And if I don't do it, all your Guido friends here, they can come and take me out. And they're looking at me. Copy it down. They go, you're a cocky guy, you know that? I said, copy it down. <laughs> so they copy down my address and everything. I go home and Karen goes, you sure? I said, come on, we just... What, what did we do in the summer? We spent two weeks at Robbie's house. So I call up Robbie. I said, Robbie, you know, nobody wants to sell these tickets. And, you know, I got you center on the thing. Could you come to my house like a month before? He goes, yeah, no problem. 
I said, good. I said, I'll set up your airline ticket. I'll fly in his wife at the time, Elaine. I said, I'll fly in Elaine too, so you and Elaine, you want, as long as you want Elaine here. You know, I always got to double check that with bodybuilders. No, no, yeah, me and Elaine will come and this and that. So he comes a week before, so I, I know I got him. So I said, so I set up like five gyms to do that. We're going on that Monday night, eight o'clock. I said, let's leave. I'm in Westbury, Long Island. We got to take the, the Belt Parkway all the way down in there. Good hour plus, let's leave early. So we go, we can't park within six blocks of the gym. Okay. Now I had been called, I called J Johnny Barbero, the owner. I said, remember, I'm coming Monday night. I called him the Thursday before. He goes, you better. He said, I got signs up, you better. Or we're coming out there. I said, no problem. You know, so we park a couple of blocks away and we're walking, me and Robbie are walking together, talking, our wives are behind us talking this and that. And we're walking, get to the street where the gym is. The gym is three quarters of the way down the street and there's like a banner is up and there's like 30, 40 guys outside. And he goes, man, we're all them people. You know, Robbie with that demon, man, we're all them people there. I said, that's the gym, they're there for you. Grabs onto my arm, man. You know, all crazy people from Brooklyn, man. All these crazy white Italian people. I'm holding on to you. You're going to make sure I get saved. I said, don't worry. You're not going to do nothing. You just do what I tell you to do. We're going to sell tickets. And they're going to love you. I said, because you came to them, they're going to love you. So as we're getting closer, somebody goes, there he is. Now, you know when a bunch of guys talking, you hear that low rumble. Silence. I was like Moses. And Robbie was my scepter. And I'm, I'm parting the Red Sea. They just opened up. And they're staring. And we go into the gym, it was a storefront, and the gym was in the basement, and everybody goes and stands along the thing, and we walk in, and there's Johnny, his father, his brothers, his uncles. I go, Johnny Barbero, Robbie Robinson. And they're there with their mouth open. The father takes a hefty trash bag, takes everything off the shelf for you, Robbie. You came to our gym. Can we take a picture? You know, and, and this and that. And Robbie goes, yeah, sure, this and that. I said, now remember, Karen's got tickets. She's gonna count them out with you. We got a bunch of tickets. We're gonna go downstairs. Is everybody in down the gym? He says, it's so packed down there, you can't even breathe. I said, we're gonna go down there, and then you're gonna announce, because they all had the little speaker system, Robbie's gonna be competing in this show, and we got tickets on sale. That was the deal. He goes, you got it. So we go downstairs, and it was wall to wall. You couldn't even train. He goes, Robbie goes, man, what do I do? I said, you're gonna stand on the bench, you're gonna take off your shirt, and you're gonna hit some shots. He goes, okay, just as long as I get out of here alive. And then I'm going to take you home and feed you. Oh, okay. You know, you feed a bodybuilder, you're happy. He's, eating, he's in great shape, you know. And they're going crazy because back then, no internet. This was mm -hmm. the pages mm -hmm. of the magazine <clears throat> coming to life. And you've got to remember, 1978, the magazine was black and white. Here's Robbie in the flesh, in color, right in front of him, on a bench, posing. And you're looking at him saying, wow, this is real. Look at this. And I, when he finished his pose, and I said, in th two and a half weeks, on May 6th, Robbie Robinson is going to be competing in New York at the town hall, and Johnny's going to have tickets. Get your tickets there. Go, yeah, Robbie, we're going to be there for you. We left him 100 tickets for the finals and about 40 tickets for the judging on a Monday night. Tuesday afternoon, he called me, and he said, I need more tickets. So we had five gyms like that. And... Robbie was the one that did the publicity for me the first year. They were chanting his name in the theater. Yeah, he was the best bodybuilder on stage, but he was also the favorite. And they were chanting away and this and that. I had Ricky Wayne, who was the editor. He was the MC. I said, Ricky, I want this showmanship. He says, okay. I said, I want you in a tux. What color you want? And he goes to me, peach. I said, fine. You know, <laughs> I looked around, I found him a peach tuxedo, put him in peach. I said, no podium. I want you walking around like a stand-up comic. He goes, I love it. Because Ricky was into that too. We did all of that, you know, standing room only, the aisles were filled with people, everybody's this and that. Now, the original name of the contest was the American Professional Bodybuilding Championships. The theme was a night of champions. Because we were going like boxing. The thriller in Manila. Every, every boxing match had a theme. Two months after the contest, a kid calls his, I get a phone call because I was the ticket number. I want to buy tickets for Night of the Champions 2. I said, no, the name of the contest was this. The guy goes, why aren't you there? It's called Night of Champions. And I'm thinking back, and I say, yeah, 
It was. You're right. Night of Champions. Yeah, tickets will go on sale. Because by then I was saying, I needed a bigger theater. I was negotiating with the bigger Beacon Theater. Had 3,000 seats instead of 1,500. I remember calling up Charlie that day. Charlie, Charlie, this is the name of the contest. It's going to be called Night of Champions. What are you talking about? He goes, the kid named it. They're naming it. Like Rocky 2, Night of Champions 2. Like this 2, Night of Champions 2. We're going to go room and numbers like the Super Bowl, this and that. Okay? He goes, okay. You know, if that's what you want, yeah, go ahead. And that's how it became Night of Champions. And we did things, that show that we did for 26 years, we did things unique. It got so unique, if we want to use that word, the weeders wouldn't come no more. You're, you're running a circus. In 82, I decide, you know what we're going to do? Carlos Rodriguez was a bodybuilder who lived in Arizona, but he was originally from New Jersey. And Carlos said, Night of Champions is going to be my last show. I'm going to retire. I said, tell you what, after you pose, you know, you could do it from the stage. And then I go, let me ask, Carlos, you live in Tucson, Arizona. You ride a horse? He goes, yeah. I'm going to rent a horse. You come out on a horse, you get off the horse. I said, well, put a little thing there that you tie the horse up to for the stage for your posing. Then you po do your posing routine in front of the horse. You go to the stage, you retire. And then when you get on the horse, we'll play that old cowboy song from that TV show of, I don't know, it was Gene Autry or whatever, Happy Trails and you ride off into the sunset and we'll dim the lights. He goes, okay. The Sunday before the show, I'm home on a Sunday afternoon, I'm looking, you know, tickets are going, I'm almost sold out already. And when I got bad news, I said, what up, Carlos? I hurt my back, I can't move, I can't come. I got the horse. I can't come. Oh, I hang, he hangs up, I'm depressed. I'm walking around the house depressed. I call up Charlie. Charlie goes, it was a dumb idea anyway. What the heck is in your head? I said, no, nah, I got to do something. I said, I had my, I was set on the horse. You know, it's something that's never been done. We got to do things. You got to be creative. You got to be entertaining. The bodybuilders all do the same things. We got to be creative. Well, whatever the heck, go ahead. Whatever you want to do. I'm looking at the list of competitors. Mm. Mm. And one name catches me. I wonder. I call up the place I was going to rent the horse from because I couldn't cancel it on Sunday. They were closed. I go, guys, the guy that was going to ride the horse, he hurt his back. He can't do it. Now, this was movie animal rental. They do it for films it in New Jersey somewhere. I said, do you happen to have a camel? And they go, yeah, George. I said, that's the camel's name? Yeah. I said, great. Can I rent the camel? He goes, yeah. I said, okay, I'll rent the camel. He said, you're going to like it. The horse was $800. The camel's only four. Not many people rent camels. I said, fine. He said, the only thing, you know, the camel comes in a little bigger truck. You're going to have come in a 45-foot tractor trailer. So you got to get the police to pardon off all of that stuff back there on the back end of 76th in Amsterdam so they could get in the back door of the Beacon Theater. I said, no problem. You know, called my dad. He called the precinct. We got it pardoned off. I say, I'm not going to tell nobody because nobody will believe me anyway. I'm not even going to tell Mohammed Makawi, who's from Egypt, that he's going to be on a camel till that night because I don't want him pulling out. So I casually mention it that morning to someone and they go to Mohammed. Mohammed, I think Wayne said he's got a camel coming. You're going to come out on a camel tonight. He goes, where's he going to get a camel from in Manhattan? You can't get a camel. So we do the judging and everything. Guys go disappear. I have the camel come at 6 p.m. Police are there, you know, right? And the cops are going, you really renting a camel for a bodybuilding show? I say, yeah. Sure enough, 6 o'clock, here comes this tractor trailer, <laughs> right? And out comes, you know, I said, you got the camel? And the guy goes, yeah, George is in there. George is very mellow, this and that. So they bring George out. So here's 6 o'clock on a Saturday night in May on Amsterdam in 76, and out comes this camel. And I go, oh, guys, you sent me the wrong camel. They go, what do you mean? It's got one hump. Doesn't he need two humps and the guy rides in between the humps? He goes, first off, do you know how rare a two hump camel is? I said, I have no idea. He goes, secondly, we got the hump basket. He sits in the basket. I said, oh, and then as he's standing there on the thing, I said, you know, when I was a kid, I'd see camels in the zoo. He's kind of big. He goes, oh yeah, there's a big camel. 
I said, how are we going to get him in the door? It's only eight foot high. He says, we'll tell George to get on his knees and he'll crawl in. I go, wow, look at that. So George crawls in and we put him behind the back curtain. You have the front curtain, the stage, you know, the curtain goes up. It says Night of Champions, the, the platform, whatever staging. And behind the back curtain, there was about 10 foot to the wall. So we put George back there and he just sits down and he's chewing on his cod. Nice guy petting him. What a nice little animal. Oh, he's big. And they put the basket on him. The guys start coming back. One of the guys looks. Oh, my God, he's really got a camel. So they go tell McCowie, Wayne's got a camel. It's backstage. No, he doesn't. So the guys all come down. It's about 6.30. And they're looking. There's the camel. I said, come on, you're from Egypt. He goes, what do you think we live in? We drive cars on the street. We don't drive camels. Yeah, but for this, you're going to do Story the camel. My life. I said, you know, <laughs> I said, you're a great bodybuilder. But you're always overlooked. This will put you on the cover of every magazine in the world. And this will set us apart from everything. I said, come on. He said, okay. I said, now you get in the basket, and the camels stand up, and this and that. So McCowie sits in the basket. Now, McCowie's only five foot three. He sits in the basket, but he doesn't hold on. And when George goes to stand up, he puts one leg out this way. Mohammed went out the back that way and rolled on his head and goes, I ain't doing this. And he runs upstairs like a jilted lover, goes in one of the dressing rooms six flights up, closes the door and says, I'm not coming out. I got to go up there. Come on. And the guys were laughing because I'm going, come on, Mohammed, please come out. Please come out and talk to me, Mohammed. Come on. Give me another chance. Give, give me in the thing another chance. I'm begging. I'm begging. And one of my backstage guys goes, goes, you got another problem. I said, what's that? The union wants to kill you. I go, why? The camel just relieved himself. <laughs> I said, whoa. So I go down and I see them and they want to kill me. I'll give you an extra hour overtime. I said, I said, let me go out the front. So the people are starting to come in and the front curtains are closed. And I see the judges. And I remember, I, I see Jim Mannion. No, nobody knew I had a camel. And Jim Mannion goes to me, you know, we've got to do something about their diet. I could smell their gas from out here. Of course, it's the urine from the camels. So they got, they got to get buckets and mops and this and that. I said, Mohammed, get in the camel. He says, I can't run a camel. I said to the guy that came with the camel, I said, you look like a camel guy. He has a beard and this and that. And I don't know. I said, you take the camel out. You make him sit down. Mohammed's got to hold on. Okay. So we agree to do it. Mohammed was, I think, competitor number three that night. So the curtain closes, you know, after competitor number two, and the MC goes, tonight you're going to see something that you've never seen on a bodybuilding show before and you may never see again. The magic of Egypt, Mohammed Makawi. And we play some kind of majestic music. He was going to pose to Chariots of Fire, but we played some other majestic music. The curtain goes up and out of the corner over there, all of a sudden, the guy comes leading out, and the people are cheering, and then they see the camel, this gigantic camel. Mohammed's hanging on one side and doing a one on bicep. I got a picture on my phone, too, to show you. One on bicep like this, and there was silence for about two seconds, and then they go nuts cheering. And he takes the camel around the platform in the front, and Mohammed's waving to the crowd, and the camel's getting a standing ovation. He goes, and the camel sits down. Mohammed jumps out of the, the hump seat, whatever you call it. The guy goes to me, what do I do? I go kneel down majestically. So he kneels down on one knee like this, holding the camel's head to his. And Muhammad gets on the platform and then they start that chariots of fire music, you know, very majestic. He poses to his team. Now, he's supposed to then get back in the hump seat and ride around and go off. He looks at me when he finishes posing Muhammad and he takes off the other way. He ain't getting back on that thing again. So the guy goes like this. I go. The camel gets up, camel gets a standing ovation, okay? <laughs> Monday morning, I get a phone call from Montreal, Canada, Ben Weider. What are you doing? You running a circus? Go to Ringling Brothers. Go to that circus. This is a bodybuilding show. You don't have animals on stage. I've had calls from all over the place. I said, these pictures are going to be everywhere, Ben. We just did something no one's ever done. Don't you understand? You know, it's entertainment. You know, people... Went, let say they, they can't believe what they saw. They're glad they took pictures. Listen, you're crazy. You're crazy. Go run a circus. Go to the circus. You're no longer part of the IFBB. Go to the circus. Ben, wait to see everything. Sure enough, it ended up on every magazine around the world. And even though people down, he goes to me, yes, you got publicity. Yes, the crazy fans in New York liked it because I had it taped. You know, and I sent them the tape. 
I said, listen to the fans on here. Do you have that tape till today? Yeah, yeah. I sent it to Wayne Galosh, oh. <clears throat> and he's wants to do a whole big thing, a uh, like DVDs of the history of Night of yeah. Champions with me doing a voiceover and this and that. Oh. And he's <clears throat> doing, but, you know, they never came to Night of Champions again. Now, I've had a bull steer on stage. Our, our theme that year was more beef than a cattle ranch. Okay? So Charlie goes, what kind of theme is that? I said, well, I said, you know, I talk to the animal rental place all the time. They got a bull steer. I'm going to get a bull steer on stage. He goes, you know how big they are? I said, yeah, they told me it's a little over 2,000 pounds. So we, I said, build me a corral and the hay and everything. I said, and the bull, he goes, but what if he goes crazy? Oh, I said, no, he comes with his thing. I said, the bull steer's name is Richard. The camel was George. The bull steer was Richard. I said, the old lady comes, is his master, and she's going to sit on side stage. As long as Richard can see her, you could do anything. Before the show, we put him in the corral because when the thing opened up and we had some of the guys that weren't competing, including Sean, in cowboy hats and everything with the bull steer. But before the show, I'm in the back. I'm in there with the bull steer. I'm picking his head, things like this, his horns. And he was, as long as she was there, I could do anything I wanted to him. You know, the show starts and Lonnie Tepper was the MC from Iron Man. And he goes... Every time I emcee this show, I never know what's going to happen. It was almost like on cue. The bull steer turns around, lifts his tail, and poos on the stage. <laughs> on stage. On stage, in his corral. People can see it. Oh, yeah, they were cheering. <laughs> New York, they were cheering. <laughs> we had to close the curtains. So again, the union guys, I had to give them another hour overtime to clean the, the, the bull steer. But bodybuilding has to be entertaining. When's the last time it was like that? Last time I ran Night of Champions or the Olympia. Bodybuilding hasn't been entertaining since I left. They don't do nothing, things like this. Bodybuilding hasn't been entertaining since you left. It's boring now. Let me ask you this. Why do some people not like you? Because uh, I was successful or I was domineering. You know, I'm putting money and ideas and everything to build a sport. You know, when I took over the Olympia, prize money was 50000 You know, we won't even get into sanction fees. And when I left, prize money was 410000 and a Cadillac Escalade. When did you leave? 2003 was the last Olympia I ran. I had over 5,500 paid people and over 6,500 in the place with comps at Mandalay Bay. Now they're in the Orleans Arena, which is not Mandalay Bay. And people loved Mandalay Bay because everything was in the same facility. See, it's only the athletes that don't like me because, you know, I made them go to the banquet. I said, a VIP ticket holders. Why, wouldn't the, why, wouldn't, why would the athletes not like you, though? Because Aren't I told so, them they had to do certain things or else I'd find I them. I want to show you a video. Hang on, hang on. Because I know your stories, I've got to uh, pace myself. Because you're, 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 I ask you one question, you can go for two hours. So I've got to pace my time in queue <laughs> I told Kanye. No, it's all good. I don't mind it. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm the one that's... And I didn't uh, even drink a Red Bull before I come. Oh, this is man. natural. Well, wait till we get you the monsters. So... <laughs> Uh, so let me pull this up. So, Paul, I got the videos here. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play two of them, okay? okay. And I want to see your reaction, obviously see what you're going to say here. And then I want to play Sean's video, and then and I want to get a reaction from you. So here's you. Uh, you'll know exactly when this is. Let's watch this one here. This is you. Quite honestly, the problem we're having is that the lab is having a tough time coming up with a test. At that time, yes. To recognize central in the urine. They thought they had a test, they didn't. So the judges will be instructed that if the muscle looks unnatural, and you can see central on the lights, they'll be instructed to vote the athlete down. I would do something that nobody does in this sport. I was the head of pro bodybuilding. Okay. I was the promoter of the Olympia. Yeah. And I would wait, do the wait. I would do the press conference, and the and the press conference was not staged like now. Okay. Where they have things. I would let anybody ask me anything, and I would answer it. Because I had nothing to hide. One time, our buddy Sean goes, "Why aren't we getting more money?" Because the athletes could ask too. I could be a target. Anybody could ask. If you want to ask me a question, is Jim Mannion going to ask, answer questions? You know, did David Pecker answer questions when he was running the Olympia? Jim Mannion's running 
everything now there? Did Raphael Santoka do that? Nobody. I went out there. We have 1,500 people at the press conference. I made the guy, they didn't like it. I made them dress in a suit. They're not dressed in suits now at the press conference. They, I wanted them to look professional. You know, you, you take NBA players. They go on a plane, they gotta be dressed. You're representing your league. You're representing your profession. You, you're a professional. Look it. You know, they didn't want, you know, you're gonna go up there on sweatsuits and everything? No, you go dressed. Once a year, you buy a suit and you go dressed. And a lot of fans saying, wow, the guys look so good. And you know, the guys would get into colorful things. You could look at some of those outfits, colorful, wild. It was different and fans loved it. Like I said, 1,500 people at the press conference. Let me pay this other one. Here's. One, 100,000 people don't watch that webcast. Yeah, this is Last it. Last year we did it for free. Less than 7,000 people came in worldwide. Actual numbers, Sean, you can check with the leader company. Okay, that was for free. This year, depending on what kind of modem you have, is how much you pay. We'll see how many people log on there. So it's not a million dollars or 25 million. Your math is a little off, Sean. It's 2.5 million would be the math correct. But anyway, we're not making a million dollars. Okay? Secondly, Sean's mouth has never heard of in a contest. Judges don't care. Sean can say what he wants. He knows I always tell him that. No problem. Third, what I will do, and this is the third time in all the years I've been involved I've done this, and the other two times, again, we have problems with athletes confronting judges aggressively. I will instruct Carlo Tiani, who's doing this on computer, to set up the program, give down a breakdown sheet to everybody. Okay? Everybody for this Once I left, I didn't do that. Here's the thing. Sean made things. The Weeder company tried to do a webcast. And Sean said something like, uh, you got, you know, 100,000 people watching it at $10 a piece. That's a million dollars. Where's our mm -hmm. money? It wasn't that money. And Vince Scalisi, who was the editor of Muscle and Fitness at the time that was doing it, I said, there's Vince right there. Vince, how many people did it? And Vince told them. They did it for two years. They lost money two years. You're in the production business. Think about doing a webcast back then, 20 years ago, with three, four cameras and everything else. Your production cost was running forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. They were barely breaking even. They, you only stop doing something when you're losing money. You don't stop doing it if you're making money. It wasn't making money. The webcast. And it was being run by the Weeder company, not me. Why would they want it to continue? Why wouldn't they want it to continue? They were losing money. No, no. The athletes. They thought they were making money and we were pocketing it. Sean makes up things. Sean has the, the, the you know, the world according to Sean. Okay? I drove him out of the sport. How the heck did I drive him out of the sport? In 2001, he's made these things. I, he can go yak his mouth all he wants. You know, there may come a day where I say, you know, Sean, if you write it or you say it, it's called libel, slander, defamation of character. Maybe I'll sue you because then you're going to have to prove it. In 2001, when he supposedly said I drove him out of the sport, he was 36 years old. He was coming to the end of his time. OK, other guys were going and they were all annoyed because they looked at Ronnie Coleman as like their little brother. And all of a sudden, little brother got bigger than everybody and was winning and was wiping the floor with everyone. And they were wondering why they were not winning or whatever, and they didn't like him winning. I don't know what it was, but I didn't drive him out of the sport. You know, when he failed that drug test, I didn't give the urine sample. I didn't collect the urine sample. Bob, Dr. Bob Goldman did back then. I didn't take it from the cup and put it into the two vials. Sean did. Sean filled out the forms. Sean put on the labels. Sean put on the caps. He gave it to Dr. Bob Goldman. He signed the documents. Goldman signed the documents. Goldman took the samples, put it in the package. Goldman sent it to the lab that he was using. Not me. This was under Goldman. That's what Ben Weeder wanted. Samples were tested. The lab called Goldman, said, 
this athlete failed. They didn't know one athlete from another. Goldman called Ben Weider, and Ben Weider said, uh, you got to tell him he failed. We don't want to. Okay, so I called Sean. I found out, I remember calling him that he was guest posing somewhere, I believe, in Toronto. And I called him in his hotel room and I said, Sean, now, unfortunately, you failed a drug test. You got the option of doing sample B. You could be there when they test it and this and that. You know, the normal procedure. But, you know, I didn't fail the drug test. I was just the messenger. But he hated me for that. That's okay. That's his prerogative. You know, Sean Ray and I are not you know, bosom buddies. Some of the guys I'm still friends with, some I'm not. Which ones are you friends with? Which one I'm good the... friends with Paul Dillette because Paul Dillette's a promoter like me. He runs the WBFF. Right. And we talk all the time, talking promotion strategies, this and that. What did you do this? What did you do there? I was always good friends with Kevin, you know. But, you know, when we took pictures, you know, they told Kevin, no, we don't want you talking to Wayne. You all these things, you know, you're not Why allowed not? to do. I just Jim Mannion's insecurities. Jimmy's insecure that way. I don't know why. I don't, have, I don't hold no will will against Jimmy. What, what was the different style of Jim running versus you running? Obviously, he's not anymore because well, it just took place last uh, two weeks ago. But what's the biggest difference between you running versus Jim running it? Well, let's take the Olympia. The Olympia, I would use 12 <coughs> judges okay, to make it as fair as possible. Six foreign judges, six American judges. Okay. We had a computer program developed where the computer would select randomly each round the random judge. So no one knew who the random judge was. And then the computer would eliminate the three highs and three lows to get to it. So in that method, if you wanted a 50-50 shot to fix a contest, you'd have to buy off nine judges. And if you wanted a 100% shot, you'd have to buy off 10. Who's going to buy off 10 judges and how are you going to keep 10 judges quiet? It is impossible. And it was the fairest way and no one knew who the alternate was. But Sean talks about the fact that if for seven years straight it was the same judges. Well, here, here's the thing. Jim Mannion picked the American judges. He don't say nothing against Jim Mannion because he needs Jim Mannion to let him in shows now. Jimmy picked the American judges. I picked the foreign judges. Okay? There would be a change of the judges. When we had panels of eight and nine, there'd be a change of two or three judges. You don't change the whole panel. Look at boxing. Do we almost know some of the boxing judges' names that we see them all the time? Right? I mean, where are you going to get people that understand the sport that are competent? Most ex-athletes don't want to judge. Why isn't Sean judging now? Why doesn't Sean go to Jimmy and say, I want to judge Mr. Olympia? He doesn't want to because if he makes a decision, he knows... If whoever he doesn't put first, only the guy in first is going to like him and everybody else is not. And he wants to be in the media part of this, because I heard he's part of uh, Digital Muscle now. They won't talk to him. You know, when you're a judge, you're stating your opinion. And people are not going to like you because you state that opinion. Because you're voting on, on a person's most personal thing, their body. And they put in time and effort and you know, the, the strain of going to the gym two times a day and, and everything you got to do to win. And then somebody rips you apart saying, well, you know, your back wasn't as good as the other guy. I put you down. You know, there's all the controversy from the 1981 Mr. Olympia when Franco won. The change we, we made after that, there was points. So when people say, how did Franco win that? Look at the score sheet. You know, Jimmy was a judge on that. Jimmy had, uh, I think he had Padilla first, but he gave a 20, he, but he gave Franco a 20. And Dominic Serta was a judge. I think he had Platts first, but he gave Franco a 20. So all these guys had a couple of 20s, but Franco had a lot of 20s because everybody would give him a sympathy vote. And when you eliminate the highs and the lows on just seven judges back then, it wasn't even eight, seven, you know, one high and one low, that's how he won. Did I think he should have won? looking at as an observer, and I co-head judged that with Oscar State? No. Do I know what happened? Because back then at the Olympia, that was in 81, was in Columbus, they would do three rounds in the afternoon, which I could never understand why. If I pay for the judging, I see round one quarter turns, I see round two, seven compulsories, I see round three to posing. Why am I going to pay more money to see the posing at night? 
made no sense to me. I split it up. But when we came back, I remember me and Oscar went back and we're adding the scores. And we look at each other. Franco's going to win. Three rounds, Franco's going to win. So we come back to the thing. Roger Schwab was a judge. Dominic Winston Roberts, all these guys, you know. They all had their guy who they thought was going to win. You know, this guy thought Dickerson was going to win. He was in great shape. This guy thought Roy was going to Roy Cowley was in great shape. Well, Franco's going to win. How? I said, well, you gave him a 20 in this round, and you gave him a 20, and you gave him a 20. And we had a change to placement, which forced the judges to judge. Because now you couldn't give away two or three 20s. Now, first, second, third, fourth, fifth. Where I say in there, we're going to give down the breakdown sheet. The judges didn't want that. Because then the athlete mm, would see. I got it. Yeah. Who paid the judges, by the way? Who, who, who? The, 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 the contest paid the judges. What do you think about that? The fact that you're paying the judges. So well, the, the, judges the loyalty of the judges is to the guy that cuts the check, isn't it? No. You sure? No. The judges, the judges were selected. I told you. Ben wanted Jimmy to select the American judges from the MPC. Fine. And I selected the foreign judges. We tried to alternate a couple. Like I said, we'd alternate a couple here and there. You can't change the whole panel every year. There's not enough competent people in the sport. Now, yeah, okay, you're a judge. You're assigned to judge what the Olympics. What do you Olympia. mean by that there's not enough competent people in the sport? Well, say that again? You, you don't think there's enough competent people in the sport to judge? The Olympia level? Yeah. No. To change the judging panel every year? No. The, now, now, these guys that you, are judges, these guys that are judges, I mean, if they don't, if they do something out of control, you're probably not going to bring them back next year. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but that's also, like, for the athlete, it's kind of like, well, then, you know, they're afraid of the guy that's cutting the check, though. Doesn't that kind of make it uncomfortable for the athlete? Cutting what check? Gonna... They get food allowance money. Well, what I'm saying is, still, that's even scarier, the fact that they're not getting paid nothing. How, why they would I take it judge. seriously? They, they, they apply to be a judge. They work their way up to be a judge. People want to be involved in the sport. You start at a local level. I want to judge. I want to learn to be a judge. Okay, you could test judge here. You could do this. It's like that in any sport. How let do you me, become let an me umpire? Ask you, let me ask who you. Who pays the umpires? Let me ask you this: Phil Heath against uh, uh, Roden. In your judgment, who should have won? I can't say unless I was there. I can't go by pictures, and I haven't been to a contest since the last Olympia I ran. So you you don't you can't say unless if you go there. I know this that you unless I'm there, and sitting in close proximity to the judges, so I see the same view as them. Yeah. I will not give an opinion. When's the last time you ride a Mr. Olympia? The last one I ran in 2003. So from 03 till today, you haven't gone? Nope. So from everything you've ever seen, all the bodybuilders you've ever seen, who's your top five best physiques? So I know you're in, dodging, in no, you're no, dodging no, the... No, no, I don't dodge. In no particular order? No, no, I want order. Like, put it in well, order. Well, in, in order, counting everything, not just body, everything. Arnold has to be first. Who's second? I would go with... Um, you know, and you got to go by certain years. I would say Arnold 73, 74, which I believe was his best. I was there. I saw it. Even though 75, it was very good. And I saw, oh, I, mean, I, I owned the outtakes at one time. So I saw all oh, 110 hours of pumping iron. But I still think 73, 74 was his peak. 75, in my opinion, he came back just to do the movie and this and that. Wasn't gung-ho like before. You got to remember, 73, when he competed, he had tore his, his knee guest posing after the 72 Olympia in South Africa, guest posing for Reg Park, needed re knee surgery. So he came back with a vengeance because people said he wouldn't come back. And he, those two years, he was right on the money. Dorian Yates in 93, uh, one of these pictures here was those, this, this one where the original picture, I think it was taken by Kevin Horton, where he had the pants around his ankles. That was before he tore anything. You put him at second. I don't know. I don't know how to put him sure. in second in the top five. Let's sure. put him in the top okay. five. Okay. Lee Haney. Lee Haney at his peak. Again, what was Lee Haney's weaknesses? He had none right there. I can't go by the guys if, after I left. It's fine. I'm okay. saying up to yeah. 03. But that's plenty of names there, up yeah. to 03. Yeah. I guess the other two would be Ronnie and Sergio. Sergio Oliva. Right. So you're leaving out a lot of names. You're taking me top five. You've got to leave somebody out. Okay. So Sergio for you and then Ronnie. At their time. You at know, their peak. I get, at I, their peak, yeah. at, at who they're competing against in their era. I'm not taking Sergio from 68 and putting him next to Coleman sure. of 2001. 
different era, different time. At that time, Sergio in 1960, nobody would compete against him. He was so good. You know, he was, he was unbeatable. You know, Lee Haney at his peak, okay, there was more pros then, but Lee Haney was very good and very complete and very big. What was Lee Haney's weakness? I mean, if he had a weakness a little bit, it was his posing, and he worked on it, you know, because we judged posing then. You know, Dorian, too, weakness was posing, worked on it. By the way, another change I wanted to make to make it better, I wanted two scores given for posing. Because the way the rules were written, and I writ wrote those original rules with Oscar State, round one when they were doing quarter turns, you're judging the same thing but a different form. So when you're doing the quarter turns, proportion, symmetry, and balance comes more into play than muscularity. When you're doing the seven compulsories, muscularity comes more into play because you're flexing. In round three, the way it was written, and they don't go by it anymore anyway, the athlete, the first two rounds, the judge is saying to the athlete, this is the way I want to see you. Round three, the athlete is presenting their body to the judge the way they want to, choreographed to music, and you only judge what you see. So, for example, Mohamed Makawi, we'll take him because we're talking camels. He was very good at three-quarter back shots, but straight on back he was no good. In his posing routine, he didn't do no straight on backs. He just did three quarters. He showed his body to his best advantage. You can hide your weaknesses. What I wanted, as routines became more entertaining, as I was pushing for that, you take like Vince Taylor. By the time Vince Taylor was really getting into the posing, doing the robot and doing Macarena Man and all of this sort of stuff, that brought the house down. He was around 40. So his physique couldn't stand next to the other guys, but he was definitely the most entertaining. So I wanted the judges to give two scores, one for the entertainment value of the routine. So on the entertainment value, yeah, Vince would have gotten a first. And it would have forced the athletes to do better routines. Because that's what you're selling to the audience. Why am I going to buy a ticket to the show if I'm going to see the guy come out there and hit four poses and then walk to each side of the stage and go like this and hit the same four and then walk to the other side and do the same thing? No. I mean, I was the one that came in with the first night of champions that you posed to your own music. I couldn't understand that when a guy gets posed, he posed to his own music. But when they went in a contest back then, they would either play Exodus over and over again from that old movie from the 1960s, or in Columbus, they had the organ player playing something as the guy was posing. And I'm saying, first night of champions, round three that we're doing at night, you're posing to your own music. Because I was good friends with Ed Corny, and Ed was posing to my way. Whenever he gets posed, even if he wasn't in tip-top shape, he'd bring the house down. He was known as the greatest poser. Yeah. Does. And <clears throat> so when Ed was going to do that first night of champions, you know, as I said, you're posing your own movie. They couldn't believe it. They said, really? We can post to our... Yeah, let's do it. We're going to put on a show. The crowd loved it. Within two years, every amateur show in America, the kid was coming with his own music to pose. We changed the whole thing. It's got to be entertaining. Why do, you, why do we watch the boxing match, okay, last week? Why do we watch football? Show coming in. The way they came in was a the show. The whole show, the whole this, right. the whole that. It's a show. It's entertaining. Do you feel it has that today? Bodybuilding? Yeah. No. Not at all? No. Okay, so let me ask you this. Recent transition with uh, Jake Wood, and you got, you got right now, you know, uh, the personalities. Uh, Jim Mannion, okay. You got Jimmy's old school. Jim, old. Jimmy's old school. Jimmy, Jimmy would always say to me, why are you spending so much money on staging? I said, because i got to give the people a show. Uh, he'd go to me. How about David Pecker? Uh, David Pecker had the option of really doing something special and taking the thing more mainstream with his mainstream publications, and he didn't do it. And, um, you know, they didn't, know how, they didn't know how to make things work. I left everything at Mandalay Bay, okay? 6,500 people. The next year, I left, right? They didn't reimburse me for the, I had the deposit down for the next two years. They didn't pay me back for the deposit on 2004, okay? I could have screwed them if I wanted to. 
because it was in my name. I could have left them hanging, but I didn't. They did it. They didn't know how to treat the people right, you know, and I don't know what happened. It went downhill. You know, they, they had a lot less people. First year I wasn't there. And then they went to Mandalay Bay, because this was told to me by Mandalay Bay people, that they went in and they wanted Mandalay Bay to be a, a sponsor of the event and put up big money and give them this and that. And they said, we don't do that. We got a line of people for this thing. And they went down the strip to find other people to run the show. And then they came back to Mandalay Bay two, three hours later, they already had it rented to someone else. I had a great deal with Mandalay Bay. I was friends with everyone there. They took care of me. Um, you know, last, you know, the last year I ran, I had 512 booths at the expo. Okay? They don't have nowhere near that now. I mean, as for Jake Wood, I mean, I don't know Jake Wood. I mean, I know obviously he's got a lot of money because according to the New York Post, he paid $70 million for the Olympia and the, the magazines. According to the Keith Kelly at the New York Post, they had a whole article about it, you know. And so he's got lots of, you know, he's an aeronautical engineer, so he's a very smart fellow. You know, I've heard that he sold his company, according to his writing, for lots of money. I heard that he developed a rivet for commercial jets, so he's, he's a smart guy. Okay, aeronautical engineer, I understand engineering, smart guy. Um, Dan Solomon. Dan, what did Dan promote before last year's Olympia? Nothing, okay. Dan Solomon's a nice guy. I, m I met him briefly before I left, nice fellow. Nobody says a bad word about him, nice guy. You know, but does he have that drive? Does he have that energy? Does he have that foresight? Does he have that creativity? What you have to be to be a promoter. You know, what is the stage going to be? What is this going to be? How are you going to get the people in? You know, I look at the other thing too. In a certain way, I feel sorry for Robin Chang because they didn't give him things to work with to market it. Okay? Meaning, I, meaning. Athletes. Mm. I mean, I was lucky I was in the right place at the right time, and I had a lot of marketable athletes. Okay? And no knock on these guys, but nobody's breaking down doors to see Brandon Curry or Phil Heath or whatever. They can say what they want about attendance, but you hear all these stories about comping this and comping that. And again, if the Olympia's making that much money, why are you selling it? Okay. If the Olympia is making that much money, why did they fire Robin Chang? Okay. Robin's doing the work. Okay. I know what it takes to run that contest. Okay. He's working on that show all year, did it for like 14 years. Okay. And they just fire him. You know, why? You know, he can only do it what he has. Okay. If you don't have marketable athletes, then you got to go, you know, I was lucky the position I was in, I would see athletes and, you know, okay, you know, that guy, if he wins the German championships, when I first saw Gunther, you know, we're going to get him, got to get him to California and this and that. He's marketable. You know, with Milos and Nasser, they were from the former Yugoslavia. And when everything split up, that formula, was, it didn't exist no more, you know, but these were good bodybuilders that were marketable. I remember when I brought Nasser in, you know, when Vince McMahon took a lot of the marketable guys away in 91, and I brought all these other guys from Europe that nobody had ever seen, one of them being Dorian Yates, 90, 91, and Dorian, Nasser, that's when I got Pastel, Benfado, Beneziza, Munza, all these new guys, and everybody's saying, where did you find these guys? All these guys were in Europe, they won there, and the fact that the other guys were gone, it was the opportunity, okay, I'll give you an invite to Night of Champions where I'll pay your way. Because maybe they couldn't, they didn't have the money to come to them. They wanted to, but they didn't have the money. So it opened the door, and I would travel around a lot and go to local contests all around the world to always look for other guys. I also looked in, you know, loopholes, like take Charles Claremont. Charles Claremont was four or five time NABBA Universe winner. 
tremendous bodybuilder in the late 80s. There was always the, the thing in England, who was better in the late 80s, Claremont or Yates? Claremont won everything, and he didn't want to compete no more. There was nothing else, because they wouldn't let him in the IFBB. And I said, Ben, this is crazy. This is the best athlete in NABA. He's retiring. He's only 28 years old. And he's a good-looking guy, beautiful, symmetrical physique, marketable. Well, you know, he has to go through the British Federation. I said, you're going to tell me he's got to go into Mr. London to qualify for the British Championships and then go into British Championships and, you know, do the if he goes into Mr. London, who's going to compete? Who's going to hurt who if he goes into Mr. London? If he goes into Mr. London, nobody else competes. You know, what? rules, 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 which annoys me, these rules sometimes. So I, I got to be friends with Claremont because I was just looking at pictures of him saying, we need this guy. Look at him. Another great bodybuilder. All I wanted to do was put great bodybuilders on stage, entertain the audience. So I got to know him. I said, you know, they want you to go to the British thing, you know, this and that. He goes, you know, I'm under a uh, Barbados passport. Oh, really? I said, according to IFBB rules, you represent the country of the which passport you're under, and the head of that federation can recommend you for pro status. Without ever winning a country, they could take a nobody and recommend them for pro status. So I got in touch with the head of the Barbados Federation. I said, you know, Charlie Claremont, this and that. And he goes to me, Wayne, I'll send you a letter of recommendation. I just want one thing. You know when you do the score sheet? Put down Charles Claremont, Barbados, not Charles Claremont, England. I said, done. So he gets a pro card, the head of English Federation at the time, Julian Feinstein, friend of mine. Oh, he's pissed. Ben's pissed. I said, let me read you the rules, Ben. Pa, 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 pa. Here's the letter. Can't say nothing. I said, you know what? And when your brother sees him, He'll be out in California, taking his, he'll fly him out to California, take his picture, put him in the magazine because he's marketable, and it sells tickets and it sells magazines, which is what happened. You know, sometimes, you know, the rules, if you're going to bend the rules, you've got to bend it for the betterment of the Federation, not for an individual, you know, promoter of money or this or that. You know, what the, all these guys don't know. As I built that European tour over the years, 11 times the promoter flopped. Couldn't pay his bills. I paid the prize money. And of course, Ben Weeder, well, you pay me my half of the sanction fee. He wouldn't even let me off do it. I said he lost money. He didn't care. I had to pay him that half. I paid. Okay? My company. That's why. I'm running the Olympia. I gotta sell VIP seats. That last Olympia, I sold I had six hundred and sixty VIP seats sold going in, every seat. At six hundred fifty dollars, you can multiply it out. Times how much per ticket? Six fifty. Six fifty at six hundred tickets. Six hundred sixty tickets. But it gets even better. In that last Olympia in two thousand and three that I ran, I go back to my room after the judging. Now there was a lot of things going on in that show, and my room is the sweetest packed. I would have Dinah Anderson, a former female bodybuilder, and her husband in the other room because she was a legal secretary, and Carlo was there from Italy because he was the computer guy and other people. And I can't even get into my room. I said, what's going on here? They go, Wayne, it's sold out, and they want tickets. And guys are going, Wayne, please, please, please. I said, let me see what I can do. The other guy that was there was Giorgio Tukalos, the star of Ancient Aliens. Giorgio's like my other son. I met him in, in Europe when he was 16. He wanted to be a promoter. He did promote for me for five years, and he was up there, too. He'd always help me at shows. So I called the box office. I go, Kim. I'm looking at the schematic. Can we fit in two other rows of folding chairs in the back on both sides of the center section? She goes, Wayne, for you, I'll, because I take the girls from the box office out every time I go on a production meeting. I, I go on a Friday because they'd never go back to work. I'd take them to the Mexican restaurant. We'd all get drunk. They call the fire marshal. They call the head of Mandalay Bay and everything. They go, Wayne, they'll do it. They'll add two rows of 16 on each side. That's 64 seats. But the fire marshal wants his two sons to be able to go backstage, and some of the executives want their sons. I said, have all the sons come. They'll be hang with me backstage the whole show. They go, done. So I go to the people in my room. I said, they're printing up tickets now. I said, Georgia, go down to Kim and get the tickets. You're going to get the finals. You'll get the banquet, and you'll get the seminar tomorrow. I'm not going to charge you $650. I got to charge you $600, and it's got to be cash. 
You got time. When Giorgio comes back, you get in a line, you give me the cash. Sold in no time. They wanted to see a show. They know it was going to be a good show. They know it was going to be entertaining. We ran that show. We had a script on the night show, both that and Night of Champions, minute by minute. We knew exactly everything. We'd collect the music on the Wednesday night at the meeting. We'd have, we knew the order of the competitors. So let's say a guy had a music, eight, nine minutes. I go, hey, you got eight, nine minutes on. Oh, I'm only going to do the first two minutes and 45 seconds. Okay, we did it. Put it on there, put it on a mini disc, cleaned it so the Acoustically, it was perfect. On a mini disc, in that order, we just pushed the number. Song number one, push it, comes right out. So if he wanted it, as he enters the stage or in position, we had it. We had it all there. Everybody's on headphones. The sound guy, the lighting guys, Charlie calling the show, me backstage, other backstage people. It was run like a regular Broadway play. The stagehands would say to us, we can't believe you do so much here for a one-night show. What kind of money are you making at this time? At the Olympia, um, I can tell you the money on the Olympia. And, you know, I'd fight with the weeders on the Olympia because they always wanted more and more. That last Olympia, our expenses were $1.65 million, And we gave away 400000 410000 and the Cadillac Escalade. And we took in about 2.26, 2 point, almost 2.3. Okay, so we made mm, close to 600000 Okay, on the show. But when you look at it percentage-wise, we were making like 27% of the gross. A normal business, if you do 10%, you're doing great. Normal is 8%. We were doing 27, 28%. Is that what the athletes were uh, upset about, the fact that they could have gotten more cash out of it, or no? I was raising the prize money every year. You don't, you don't know what the attendance is going to be. I raised it every year, and then every year they're adding in. You've got to remember, that was just the men. I had women's bodybuilding, yeah. I had fitness bodybuilding, and by the 2003 I had figure. One of the problems that they have now is you got so many divisions. Last year they gave away about 1.45 million in total prize money. Okay, 800,000 to the men, total prize money. You got Dwayne Johnson with Athleticon saying on the bodybuilding part, they're hinting that they're going to top the Olympia. Well, you're going to have to go more than 1.5 then. Because the Olympia, if they do all the things to add wellness in another division, they're going to go over 1.5. It's not just Mr. anymore. You know, it's, it's all over the place. I look at what they're doing at Leticon, and you've got to remember, the Olympia, the focal point was Mr. Olympia bodybuilding. Everything was bodybuilding. We'd start on Wednesday night. They laughed at me saying, what are you going to do on Wednesday night? Muscle movie night? I said, yeah. It's going to get the fans in earlier, get them in the mood. It's for free. The hotel's giving me the room for free. I got to pay $150 for the thing to project it on the screen. But with every movie each year, I'm going to bring in somebody. So, of course, the first year is Pumping Iron. Everybody's seen it. But I brought in George Butler. And they could ask Georgie any question about the film and this and that. 450-plus people showed up. Now, of course, every room night, I get credit for free rooms and I get a kickback. Okay. After you pass so much, they make you all these deals and everything. And the more I got, that's why I got the Expo Hall for free. I got 168,000 square feet at Bayside B for free because I booked so many rooms. I had so many room nights in the place. Okay? The guys liked me so much, the union guys, they'd say to me, Wayne, nobody's in here. When do you want to come in and set up? And I go, well, set up days at tw back then with 25000 a day plus units. Where are you going with this? What, what's I'm the just point? saying, because where I'm going is, where's the money is, why we made so much profit, because I made deals with people. Right. So let me ask you a question. In 03, your last one you did, how much did first place make? Um, 400000 You had to make 100 or 125 plus the car. So, so I'm winning 100 grand plus the car to escalate. Yeah. yeah. So first place is winning somewhere around 200,000 dollars, 150. Because yeah. the car is 50 grand, let's just say. It was fully loaded, extended Cadillac Escalade. That's about 60 grand. 60 grand. Yeah. Okay. So I'm winning about uh, between 160 to 180, depending yeah. on if it's yeah. 120 yeah. or 100. And now it's up to 400,000 dollars. Yeah. From 03 to now 400,000 dollars, growth. Okay. Once say 120, it's 3x. Okay. I mean, it's it's gone relatively high. So let, let me let me ask you this. Do do you know? You go into, uh, uh, Dana got heat because Dana wasn't paying the fighters well, okay? That's mm -hmm. what Dana White was getting heat for. You got uh, 
uh, uh, in, in mob world, Paul Castellano got hit because he wasn't sharing the profits that the family was making, so eventually they took him out, kind of like they took you out. Okay, eventually... Uh, they took uh, me out. I quit. I, you quit and you, I get it, but also at the same time, you don't have a lot of allies with these competitors because when I look from the outside, when you, you're like the ideal promoter to do this kind of stuff. But, hey, but let me, let me, let me get to my okay. question. Yeah. Here's my question for you. This is where I'm going with this. But eventually... What, what a Mayweather did, Mayweather said, I want to take counts on how many pay-per-views we sell. So what about if we change a portion of the payout? Because, you know, a lot of the camp, there's two camps. There's one camp that's saying, this last Mr. Olympia, biggest ticket sale ever, more than, it's the greatest they've ever had. If you look at the pictures, it was so bad you couldn't fit a single person in here. It was unbelievable, right? Now, you weren't there. So if you don't but want to the, critique. But the upper deck was, was not even opened. Okay. I'm just telling you yeah, what this. I, I, they, hey, so now I, watch this. The, the other side. So what? What if uh, you know you got an opportunity to say, guys, first place is 400 grand. Okay. What else? And here's the thing: if you help us sell X Y Z amount of tickets, on top of that, I'm going to put another three hundred thousand dollars into the pool with the same mathematical formula, so maybe top's gonna get 60,000, and that's gonna, if you sell this many tickets, another 600,000, if you get this much, another $900,000. Now, I'm going to place with this. So the athletes are not gonna be saying, well, there's you one, pay. There's one thing you're not taking into What's account. That? Two thirds of the profits went to the Uyghurs. At that time? Yep. How about today? I don't know what their deal is now. Right. So at that time, wait, out of the $600,000, two-thirds went to the uh, weeders, so $400,000 went to them, Two hundred dollars was kept by you. Is this public? Everybody knows this? I never hit it. Oh, okay. So, so wow, two-thirds went to weeders. No yeah. shit. Okay. See, that's uh, why when Sean talks, you don't know that. Well, now, here's the other thing. You've got to remember, you know, I was the one to keep Miss Olympia alive. That's why we created the Olympia Weekend. Because if Miss Olympia was on its own, it was going to die. First of all, I'm giving you a compliment. I think you're a crazy <laughs> promoter. What I'm trying to tell you yeah. is you're a ridiculous promoter. Yeah. I mean, you're, you can't even hold yourself with all these stories and the way you're telling details. You're telling the details well, I of... I got crazy minds. I know, but you're, that's a part of a, being a promoter. You so have to know that You stuff. can't teach this. You can't no. teach somebody how to do this. You either got it or you don't have it. So... You could have gone, been a politician, been a campaign manager for somebody. Yep. You would have done a great job just to go in that route. So, so, okay, so what do you think right now with the future of Mr. Olympia? Do you think, uh, do you think Athleticon is bringing, because, you know, sometimes the political answer is, oh, we always knew Athleticon was going to happen. We support The Rock. This is great. This is just going to bring more attention to Mr. Olympia. This is a very good thing. Behind closed doors, we've been talking to each other. This is exactly what we want him to do. Then there's another camp that says, hell no, The Rock and... Danny, they want to take the entire attention away, and they want to kind of get, get the Athleticon to become bigger. What do you know with some of the conversations you're having? Okay, let, let's look at this. Before the sale, do you really think that Robin Chang wanted to help the Olympia? David Pecker fired him. I, I don't think Robin, now I didn't speak to him. I'm just looking from the outside. Would he really want to help David Pecker? I don't think so. Okay, so now that it's gone to Jake Wood, I don't know what that dynamic is. I mean, Athleticon, if you read what they're trying to do there, this is beyond anything. And you gotta remember, Athleticon is not a bodybuilding show. It's not, yeah. It's a fitness thing. Bodybuilding's one part of it. Sure. And, you know, the fact, I mean, what are they paying? And even though Dwayne Johnson has connections in the Hollywood industry, he says he's going to have top music acts and top comedians at that party Saturday. I read about Athletic Con and I said, wow, I want to buy a ticket and go. How do you fight that? How yeah. do you compete against yeah. that? I said, I want to buy a ticket and go. It sounds great. They're going to have meditation, yoga. They're going to have everything there. Now, his budget, I would estimate he's using all of the World Congress Senate. It's 850,000 square feet. And he's using the outside area. I've read to do the, the party, that Saturday night thing, that got to have a ton of security there because if you're going to have alcohol and everybody partying, it's like a club or whatever, you know how that goes. But his budget's got to be somewhere between 7 and $10 million. Okay. You know, that's heavy duty. We know where the Olympia budget is, the Arnold budget's probably between a half to four, say, in there with everything. This is, 
This is big time. Is this a threat, though? Well, I mean, it depends on if the promoters are working together. I mean, I always had a relationship with Jim Lorimer, and I would never push the Olympia until the Arnold was over, and vice versa. Respect. Yeah, respect. Right. And we were friends, respect. Yeah, but and, you're, you're, and, you're, team, and was, you're team Arnold. You, yeah. you, you guys have and a relationship. I would, you know, they would hire me to coordinate the bodybuilding part of their event. So we were all together. Um, I don't see any big things from Athleticon yet, so maybe they got the same respect there, you know? And we don't see anything big from the Olympia yet. You know, of course, the sale was going on. I don't know what Jake Wood's objective is. If he just doesn't care about making money, he could make the most spectacular event ever, okay? I don't know. You know, if he wants to make money, well, he's gotta make a lot of changes. You know, hey, Jake, you want to make money? Give me a call. I'll give you advice how to make money on that event. You know, but, you know. Was that a plug? Let me ask you. Let me ask you a question. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Are, are you indirectly wanting to go back and promote Mr. Olympia? No. Would no. you like to? No. If, if it, was, it sounds it, like it. No, no. I like promoting. If Jake called you and says, listen. I, I, I want you to come and consider promoting Mr. Olympia. Would you do it? I talked to him. Okay, so you would want to do it. I, I, if the money was right, it I'm doing like it for money. It feels like there's an itch there. It feels no, like no there. I just like, I, you know, I like to create. I like to, it's like, I'll give you an example. When I was a little boy, you know, I used to like my electric trains. But I put all these elaborate setups. But after it was built, and they went around a circle, once I was bored. Hmm. What I found with contests, I come up with a concept, we're going to do this, the ads are going to be this, it's going to be that, and you build to that day. And once you get to that day, it's over. Yeah, you relax, you this, but then you start all over again. It's like a movie. I know why people like movies. I could have, you know, my brain could have went for that. You do a movie, you put all this effort in, you do this, you use that, and then you move on to another project. I was thinking of leaving bodybuilding. I was getting bored numerous times. It was becoming the same thing over. And I was going to quit after 98, a um, couple of things. One, I was getting bored, and two, that's when I got the prostate cancer, and who knows what was going on. And then the opportunity came to move it to Vegas. Vegas excited me. Okay, Vegas, fun, this and that. And the possibility of staying in the same location and building it out. But by 2003, when I went, after the contest was over, and the banquet goes on, but I never made it to the banquet. We're taking down things. We've got to make sure everything gets backed in the truck and everything is the right way. And my second wife, Palvinari, was there with my son. And they held a little bit of food for me. And I remember saying to her that night, I said, uh, I don't think I'm going to do this anymore. Said, what do you mean? You, you should have made a lot of money. There were so many people. And Arnold shows up for you. Arnold came to that 2003 Olympia because I donated for his campaign and one of the few people from bodybuilding that did. And when I went to his last fundraiser that was run by Goals and World's Gym, when he walked through the crowd, he saw me there and says, Vane, you came? I said, oh no, I support you. He says, I come to Olympia for you. And this was the Friday, a week before, eight days before. I said, oh no, you're gonna win on Tuesday. It's gonna be Kane. You have my word, I come for you. I don't say a word to nobody because you, know, you put that out there and then you don't show up. It's a letdown. So I don't. Charlie don't even know. Smart Nobody move, knows. Though. Nobody Smart knows. Move not to do that. And <clears throat> we, we finished our judging. We would do the judging at 12 noon on a Saturday. And at 2 o'clock, I get a call. And they go, Wayne DeMille? I go, yeah, this is uh, Chief So-and-So from the California Highway Patrol. We need you to put us in touch with the Nevada State Police, the Las Vegas Police, and the Mandalay Bay Security. I said, uh, any reason? They go, yes, the governor-elect is coming. This and is when, when he, you know it's legit. Yeah. And yeah. he goes, when he lands, we're going to close down Las Vegas Boulevard so he doesn't get caught in traffic. I said, well, when is he landing? They go about 7 o'clock. I said, you're going to close down Las Vegas Boulevard 7 o'clock on a Saturday night? He goes, yes, we are. And, you know, that's when I called Mandalay Bay. A little leak out, not much, but he came. And the fans didn't know. What was the reaction? Oh, it was a pandemonium. That's your last one ever. Yeah, my last Olympia was and the best one. And you finished it with that. Yeah. 
and you didn't come back. Nope. Did you get fired or you didn't come back? Me and Ben were fighting so much every day. Pecker wanted to take over. He said, you know, if I take over the Olympia, you know, you're going to run it and this and that. I said, I can't take it with Ben no more. And then he made a deal with Ben, you know, and Ben said, well, you know, Wayne and Pecker, Wayne and Lorimer were trying to undermine me and this and that. And Arnold told Pecker, don't sign with Ben, you'll regret it. And he Arnold goes, told Pecker, don't sign with Ben, you'll regret it? Mm -hmm. Ben and Joe, Ben? Ben, ben and, and Arnold didn't get along. But, but Arnold got along with Joe, but not yeah, Ben. not Ben. What's Ben's personality like? Ben was a businessman, Joe was more the bodybuilder guy. So Ben fired you? Ben, ben said to me, I don't think we can exist anymore. I said, you're right. I said, I can't take this anymore. I'm living in stress every day with my medical condition. I don't need stress. I don't need this no more. You think you can do it better? Go ahead. Watch what happens. And I said, that's it. What's the last Olympia that was the biggest Olympia? Is 03 the last biggest one? I, I can't tell what other Olympias did since I left. I wasn't there. Okay. I don't know what the box office receipts are. I can't comment on something I was yeah. not on the inside for. But, you know, you don't have marketable guys either. They're not bringing in marketable guys. How do guys. you know, though? You don't, you don't know. You're not there to see it. You said, I don't want to judge because I'm not there. So what no, do you mean? No, I'm saying they're not marketable. They're not selling the tickets. There's no excitement. Is there excitement about Brandon Curry? No knock on the guy. He may be a nice fellow. I don't know him. But I don't see an excitement there. Yeah, marketable is a different story you're yeah, talking about. Yeah, marketability is, is a completely yeah. different I thing. I get it. I totally you know, get it. You got to have a personality. Arnold was marketable. A, yeah. Even Matarosa, who was 16, you know, wasn't winning, but he was still a marketable personality. You had some of these guys that were marketable personalities. So, so okay, last... And, and, then you had, and then you had, at the time, you had magazines with Joe knowing how to create personalities and create marketable guys. Yeah. Okay? Now with the internet, magazines dead, it's almost self-promotion, and it's all over the place. And you may have so many followers on Instagram or whatever, but it doesn't translate into tickets. You got to do that. Last yeah. question for you. Yeah. One of Joe Weider's dreams was to, for Mr. Olympia to go into uh, Olympics. I know they did the Pan Am stuff. Is this ever going to happen? Or that is was it... Ben's dream. Raphael's trying. But you got the drug testing problem. It's difficult. You know, the IFBB, Raphael's part of the IFBB, because both Jimmy and Raphael... Is Raphael your boss or no? Huh? Is Raphael your boss or no? Technically. Technically, kind of, he's your yeah, boss, it's right? Kind of, you know, when he called me to ask me to come, you got to remember, I was his boss. Yeah, I know that. But, but I mean, it's, you're almost like doing each other. For, you, it's um, it's yeah, not even a... Yeah. yeah, I mean, I call up Raphael. It's different, you know. But there's prisoner. respect. There's respect oh, yeah. for... No, yeah. I told him. I said, right. Raphael, you know me. I said, every time I would flip out on yeah. Ben, Ben would call you up saying, I can't take it with him no yeah. more. I said, but you want me to be aggressive and energetic because if I'm not, then I'm useless. If I don't have this energy, then I'm no good for anything, okay? So if I don't have a passion for what I'm doing, then why do it? Get somebody else. You just want a yes man, now, I'm not the guy for you. I'm not the guy for you. You know, you gotta be aggressive. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not making no money running the body, but I make my money doing other things. But, you know, it's kind of fun trying to teach young, younger guys or guys that never promoted before to do it. Some catch on and do it and they follow you. Some don't. It's kind of nice on these, yeah, these shows aren't big. 35 people in this show, 22 people in this show, whatever. And, but when the athlete comes up to you and says, you know, we like the organization you're putting together. You know, nothing's going on here. You know, heard the alleged things. You're talking things. about Physique America is what yeah. you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. IFBBPhysiqueAmerica.com. That's what you're doing. Yeah. And, you know, so when an athlete comes to you and says, you know, thank you, it was a nice show. We're taking all the membership money, okay, and we're sending athletes every show to different international events. You're Nobody not, does that. You're not doing it for money. This is a passion play. Yeah. You still have the passion for this game. Yeah, to a point, yeah. To, yes or no? Yes. So not to, what's the two point? Well, well, the point is... Money, you got to make some money if these guys call you. Yeah, if the other guys want me to, you know, I'm not going to, you know, for years of running the Olympia and teaching myself, learning on my own how to run big events, I'm not going to give it away to Jake Wood. This is a crazy question Solomon. for you. Crazy, I mean, not a crazy question. Yeah, Just curious question. on what you... What, what is a quality of a great promoter? What makes a great promoter? From your eyes, 
You're a great promoter. What makes somebody a great promoter? You have to have the passion for it. One. Okay. You have to be creative. You got to think like a fan. What entertains you? I'm still a fan. I would always say to people, you know, when the show started and I'm sitting there with the judges, I got the best seat in the house and the show goes and I'm creating this whatever, this entertainment that I put in my head. You got to entertain people. Anything pro is entertaining. This show is no good if you don't entertain people. Yeah. Why do people watch it? You got to be entertaining. If everybody comes out and does the same thing, it's boring. Nobody ever knew what I was going to do at Night of Champions. So, so a sense of surprise, a sense of unknown. Yep. You think that's the quality of a promoter? Part of it. Uh, what else? So, so far I have passion, creative, uh, entertain, a sense of the unknown. And what you, else? You got to work all the time. You got to work all the time. I would I say to promoters, you're promoting a show. Every day you got to get something accomplished. I when I would run the Olympia, I would give myself goals. I would play games with myself. I would say, okay, this week I'm going to raise twenty thousand dollars in vendors and sponsors. And let's say I sign a company for twenty five thousand on Tuesday. I don't take the rest of the week off. Hey, maybe I could get to fifty thousand this week. I'm going to push even harder the last three days. I was always competing against myself. To make it better. That's why in 2003, you know, let's face it, in 2003, you had, well, let's go back a couple of years. Jay was winning in 2001 after the judging, and Ronnie came back and beat him. And Jay got mad. He thought, I fixed the show against him. I said to him one time, I'm a promoter. I do this to make money. Who's going to sell me more tickets? A big white blonde guy or the big black guy? Come on. Don King told me one time, Don King came to, when we did, Women's bodybuilding, the women's pumping iron. And he saw I was promoting that thing. He goes, remember one thing, boy? White means green. I knew what he meant. He goes, you know how much money I made off Jerry Cooney fighting Holmes? We all knew Holmes was going to kill him. His boxing kills were so... But they built up Cooney to get the thing. The audience is 95% white, right? You don't have white guys in the show, this and that. Jay Cutler didn't win in 2001. He was upset, so he didn't compete in 2002. Let's go back, stay focused. Hang on, because I want to get this out of you. Because, right, because I'm trying to get this out of you, because I think it's brilliant <laughs> what you're saying. Number one is passion. Yep. You've got to be passionate about what you're promoting. Number two is being creative. Yep. You can't think like everybody else and be logical or conventional. Number three, three is entertain. You've got to entertain folks. Entertain Number four people. is the sense of the unknown, some kind of a surprise. Yep. Number five, you're working all the time. Yep. Number six, you said competitiveness. You uh, got to compete against yourself to push yourself to succeed. It, okay. How about the next one? Do you think there's a part of it of you choosing the right person to be face of the the sport, uh, all of that, or no? You don't think that plays? I didn't pick the face of the sport. Meaning Connor is great. I get that, but Connor is great for MMA, right? Right. Mayweather was good for yeah, boxing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the thing is, I would pick the guys who I put on the poster who would sell me tickets. I'd go to sign up a guy. So maybe that's pick the marketable yeah. guy. Yeah, we got to okay. pick the marketable yeah, guy. Yeah, I'm with you that. Know, I, this at Night of Champions. At Night of Champions, we would try to get the year before's overall USA and Nationals winner. That would be their pro debut. I would always say, whoever wins the USA and the Nationals, you turn pro, I fly you into Night of Champions, you're in that show. So the fans knew they were going to see the young, up upcoming guys here. I would always bring back three, four, five favorites. People that they knew, you know, that they liked, that the New York audience liked, who are stars, and they liked. I always bring in an unknown from Europe, okay? So I would fly in, because I would have sometimes 45, 50 guys in Night of Champions. I would pay full expenses for like 16 to 18, and then guys from, that lived in the area that could drive, I would pay their hotel. I said, you're driving on Friday. I don't want you going back and forth. You stay in a hotel. I'll pay partial expenses. And then guys that I didn't know that wanted to come and pay their way and make their mark, do this. During the judging, the judges would judge 1 to 15. Everyone else is 16. At the beginning of the show at night, the ones that didn't make the top 15, they'd come out, depending on how many, one or two at a time, and do, you know, 15, 20 seconds of posing, and this and that, and then they were done. The top 15 did their full posing routine for the audience. We would start that show at 8.05, we'd, we'd end at 10.15 on the button, all timed out. You want the people leaving wanting more. Okay, not that's being another bored. one. Okay, so what else? So here's, again, passion, creative, entertain, sense of unknown, work your ass off, compete against your prior best, pick the right person to be the face, like a marketable guy, think like a fan, 
What you just said right now is people leaving wanting more. Give me one more. I'm going to okay. get one more out of you. Just having energy to do it. I mean, that's, miles that's, I would walk in Mandalay Bay going from my room down the elevators to where the convention was, where the theater was, where this was, where that was. You got to do what you got to do. Give me one of these, man. We're not even done, and I was freaking sick. I got to tell you that. That was sick. Anybody, no matter what business you're in, you, you just heard from one of the best promoters in the sto- sport of bodybuilding, which was never a marketable product years ago, to go from doing the most shows. We can learn something from here. The, the, the promoter. Speed round. I'm going to give you a name. You give me one word. Okay? Let's see what you can do here. I give you a name. You give me one word. Jim Mannion. Friend, former friend. <laughs> friend or former friend. Well, he don't want to talk to me. I Maybe have to because say former you, friend. But that's two words. Okay. okay. For, it's okay. Now, you're okay with that. <laughs> I'm not an enemy. I don't hate okay. no one. You know, I don't you. know why. Arnold. Greatest bodybuilder. Greatest. Greatest ever. Lee Priest. Uh, under, underappreciated. Wow. Sean Ray. Um, one word for Sean Ray. Mm, unhappy. He, 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 you know, not one word, but, you know, there were years, you know, I like Dorian. Dorian's a great guy. 91, he pushed Haney. 92, he won. He was like 220-something pounds. 93, he was tremendous, that picture. But when he started tearing things, I didn't agree with the judges that he should have won, you know? Just my opinion. I thought those years... Could Flex have won? Could Sean have won? Could Kevin have won? Yeah, I, I, I could have seen that, you know, but I wasn't a judge. And I don't tell the judges who to vote for. I tell them how to judge, meaning apply the rules, but I don't tell them who to judge, who to vote for. Yeah, Sean, I mean, when you look at Sean's physique, there are no weaknesses. You know, what's Sean's weakness? He wasn't quite as tall as the other fellows. He probably could have wore his trunks a little bit higher so he didn't see him as long-waisted. You know, you create an optical illusion. You look at the guys back in Arnold's time, how much bigger the trunks were. Now they're basically wearing bikinis. If your trunks are higher, you don't seem as long-waisted, where they say, oh, this guy high lats. Well, if his trunks were, you know, an inch below his belly button instead of six inches, it's all an optical illusion. And that's why I think Sean was unhappy. You know, people would say to me, why do you let him speak? Why do you let him knock you? Why do you let him say things at the press conference? And I would always say, Sean may say 100 things. 99 may be idiotic or annoy me, but he may say one thing that's good. And that's what you have to do when you're in charge. And that's something that nobody sees. And let's look at another thing. No matter who the president is, half the people hate him. Okay? If you're in charge and you let people have freedom to speak and speak their minds and write anything they want and say anything they want publicly, privately, you're going to get knocked. Once you come out from the crowd and you're up here, you're a target. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to be a target, then don't do it. You know, I understood that from the beginning, and it was like, I understood that other phrase, publicity, good or bad, as long as they spell my name right, as long as you put about the things. You mention the contest, you mention this, you mention that. What is my job? Not to pat myself on the back. My job is to promote good contests. I, if I continue to promote good contests and make money, I continue to promote contests and build a sport. If I had lost money and gone away, what would have happened to pro bodybuilding? If I didn't take that risk and use my own money? Yeah. People criticize you, I'm sure. All the time. Yeah. Do you care? No. no. You enjoy what you're doing. Actually, I learn a lot. I got to tell you, I learn a lot uh, because the way I look at it is my, my heavy-duty critics who are competitors, they're the best consultants I'll have because they identify my weakness more than my peers ever will. And that's how you get better. It's the best consultants. Yeah. Cheapest consultants because you don't pay for it. They yeah. just criticize you. Yeah. It's like, you know, I would get criticized at those things, guys that were into women's yeah. bodybuilding. Why don't the women get paid as much as the men? They don't bring in the money. Mm. I would say to people during those press conferences, you want to run Miss Olympia? You think it's so profitable? I'll talk to Ben. We'll give it to you with no sanction fee. You could run it. See what happens. I put it together to keep it. The men are supporting the women. That's why we did it. That's the longest two words I've seen in my yeah, life, well, by the way. So it's okay. it's okay. It's okay. It's <laughs> okay. David Pecker. David Pecker. 
Uh, there's so much goes on with David Pecker, bodybuilding and non-bodybuilding. <laughs> 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 you know? Trump. Trump is the <laughs> That's my answer. Trump. Okay, fair enough. Joe Weider. Um, innovator. Ben Weider. Administrator. Ronnie Coleman. Great champion. Again, champion. Flex Wheeler. Aesthetics. El Sombati. Mass. Phil Heath. I don't know him that well. I, oh, okay. I don't, so I don't post 03. Uh, uh, fair enough. Um, uh, Mike Matarazzo. Great guy. Great guy. It hurt me when he left us. I, it hurt me. And some of these guys, when they've gone, mm, the night NASA died, Kevin, Paul, and myself were on the phone till 3 in the morning. I mean, you know, you got to remember, on those tours, we'd live together like a rock band, you know, and, you know, Nasser, Paul, Flex, Chris, Milos, you know, there was a group of guys that would go, we'd go every year. Vince, Ronnie, a lot of the times, Dorian do half of it. Sean never went. I don't think... The guys could be rough on each other at times, okay? I don't think he had the temperament to handle that. Um, but we were close. We, we'd get in fights where we wanted to beat each other up, and we'd other times we'd defend each other, and we talk about it, and we laugh about it. I mean, um, and, you know, NASA was only, what, 47, 48? It hurt. Matarazzo, you know, Matarazzo found happiness. He had a young daughter, you know. And, you know, some people get bad side effects from the supplements and some don't. It's like some people get lung cancer from smoking and some don't. And, you know, Mikey, Mikey's heart couldn't handle it, you know. And um, he was on the list for a transplant and it didn't come in time. You know, and that hurts, you know, because um, it was more than just with some of these guys, um, athlete and official. You became friends in a certain way. I knew Mikey's mom and dad, dad his dad was in a wheelchair whenever he'd compete in Night of Champions. I said, your dad never has to get a ticket. He gets a badge, wow. and he comes right down in front, and this and that. You know, Mikey appreciated that. But, hey, I was happy that dad was there. Poor guy was in, you know. I, I look at myself. I'm 70 years old. I've been fighting prostate cancer for 22 years. They told me in 1998 I had one to three months to live, and here I am. I'm bouncing around. Look at me. And, you know, I think Mikey's dad, when he would come to the show, he was in the late 50s. The poor guy was in a wheelchair. It's like, you know, you look at other people, you know, and then you realize how lucky you are. And you don't complain about your life. You just go on in life and just be thankful every day. I wake up every day and I say, how oh, nothing hurts. I could go to the gym. Hey, I can't lift what I used to, but I could still do okay. And cancer, you're not going to get me today because I'm going to drink my green drink and have my almond milk and drink liters of water and do whatever I got to do to live a good life and to be the way I am. You know, a lot of people don't believe my age because of my energy. And, you know, when I take the drugs that kill my testosterone, I mean, basically, they chemically castrate me. Half the year, I'm chemically castrated. Mm -hmm. And you suffer depression. I've learned how to deal with it without drugs. I found that what works for me is espresso, being Italian. You know, the caffeine kicks in a little bit of serotonin, and I'm fine. But, you know, when I'm on the drugs, especially after four months, you wake up with suicidal thoughts. But I'm lucky I know how to deal with it. And then I just get myself down and this and that. Sometimes you wake up in the middle of the night, the suicidal thoughts are so bad, you got to get up at 3.30 in the morning because you can't sleep. You know? So you appreciate other things in life, and then you deal with it. You know? And like I said, when we lose some of our guys, Munzer. Munzer competed in San Francisco Grand Prix. I guess that was 94, I believe, off the top of my head. And I saw him when he checked out of the hotel on a Sunday morning. And I get a call Tuesday early in the morning, my time, 
from one of my guys in Germany saying he passed away last night. I said, I saw him Sunday. He flew home. He got home Monday. He went, to a, went out to eat. He was drinking beer. But everything fell apart in his system, you know, and he, he died, you know. And, you know, he wanted to be a champion so much that he would take drugs to mask things, even though he was told by many doctors, stop doing this, mm -hmm. you know. And sometimes guys can't. They want it so bad, you know. And the steroids, come on, we all know what we felt like when we were 17, 18, 19 years old, like, you know, we could run through the wall, we're indestructible. Well, you know, they're taking steroids, artificial testosterone is 10 times that amount. So mm -hmm. they feel yep. indestructible and they can't go. You know, it's crazy. You open up with that, you're finishing with that. It, yeah. it tells you, you know, what consumes your mind the most with the sport. You know, I, I got to tell you, Wayne, I, I almost didn't do this interview. When they reached out to me, I'm like, why, why am I going to sit down with me? I don't want to do any more bodybuilding interviews. <laughs> this is not a bodybuilding channel. I'm like enough of these bodybuilding. It's my passion. I love the sport. I, I, I see, uh, uh, I grew up with this thing. I've made my money because of bodybuilding because every single time a guy named Fred Gambari, uh, 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 I'm saying his last name probably wrong, at YMCA told me to increase the weights by two and a half pounds and I went from barely benching the bar to doing three plates and a quarter on each side and I was in the army competing and I wanted to be a Mr. Olympia guy and I said, I don't want to do it. But that that discipline of being a bodybuilder for that period, it, it, it bled into work, it bled into business, it bled into entrepreneurship. So I feel like, in a way, I wanna give back as much as I can, uh, but this is a channel that's for business and we do a lot of different interviews. But I gotta tell you, I had a blast sitting with you. Hey, this is the longest interview we've ever done. Would you say yes? Mario, how long have we been sitting here? First of all, you're long-winded, very obvious. You can talk for nights, for days. But I've had a Put blast. Put me on that, that stage there in a debate. I'll, I'll, I'll talk I, Bernie. I, I'm just <laughs> telling you, I really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you. I Thank really you. sincerely enjoyed talking to you, just having a conversation with you. And uh, I know we cover a lot of different things, a lot of different topics. I know the bodybuilding community is going to look at this and they're going to do what they're going to do and they're going to say gonna whatever they're going to say. And we didn't even get into the pumping iron films that no, I was involved. We, 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 we didn't, didn't even get into that I was hired by Major League Baseball to help them with if drugs. If I do that, I'm not going to get a chance to <laughs> yeah. kiss my daughter goodnight tonight. Uh, but I, but I, but children I, are more important. But, but I, wanted to, I wanted to have this conversation with you and I'm glad it went in the direction it went because I feel smarter every time I'm sitting down and I got it from a different perspective on what you said. And uh, I hope the viewers that are watching this as well got a different perspective about Mr. Olympia. There's one thing for sure. Like you, not like you, disagree with you. The passion's there, and there's no way in the world somebody can teach somebody how to have that passion. That passion is in your mm. bones, and it's very, very obvious. And uh, again, I appreciate you for coming out. Thank but you. For people to get a hold of you, what do you want to do? What do you, what do you want to direct them to? Is there uh, anywhere they just you go to Physique America, IFBB PhysiqueAmerica.com. Okay. And and we're going to put that link below for them to get a... Uh, see yeah. that? Any? Are you an Instagram guy or Twitter? Any of that I, stuff? Or I, don't, I don't. I'm None on there, but I don't post anything. You don't really post nah, anything. No, I'm not into it. Well, that. I mean, for anything, we'll send the link yeah, over there. Yes, and put it to that. So, if they want to compete in our shows, and like I say, you know, like um, our first show is March 22nd in Florida. Two athletes are going to win a trip, a male and a female. This, this is going This is going to stay for a while. So yeah. instead of giving a date, yeah. just keep in mind that these guys are going to be going any to Seville. There's, some people are going to go to Arnold Classic South Africa. Some people win trips to our pro qualifier in Miami in July. You know, I'm not taking a dime. I'm putting all the money back and people think I'm crazy. But you know what? You can't take it with you. I would always get on Ben Weeder. I said, what are you going to do with all this money? You can't take it with you. And he would always go to me, I'm going to try. <laughs> but you can't. You know, and, you know, I, I think my disease, my illness, I was always positive, but it put, brought me to a different level, you know. And whenever I get caught up in the business rat race, say, I always bring myself back to the night before my surgery where the doctors came in saying, wait, we're going to open you up and this and that, but we think it's in the lymph nodes. We think you, got, you don't have much time, blah, blah, blah. And I thought in my head when they left, I said, when I get past this, because I was always positive, I'm not going to let relationship problems, business problems, financial problems affect me because those can all be dealt with another individual. This 
I had to be blessed to get to here. Whatever reason why I'm still here, I don't know. You know, the cancer's still in me. I go for tests every three months. I go for scans and this and that once a year. I got to do what I got to do. But, you know, it makes you look at life different. So when things go bad and, you, and you're upset about something, I always pull myself back and say, ah, it's okay. No big deal. It's, it's very good. obvious. It's very obvious you got that, and I applaud you for it. And, and again, like I said, all the bodybuilders, I like them all. You know, I like Sean. I don't hate Sean. You know, like I said, he's a great bodybuilder. You know, he, he's got, you know, he, the, his you, perspective. You, you're going to hear from him. You're going to hear from what they're saying from yeah. this one anyway. Oh, so. yeah. Let, I, I, you know, hey, they can say what they want. You know, I basically, some people say, Wayne, you created pro bodybuilding. Because it really didn't exist before you came along and you did all these shows and la, la, la. You know la. what I think we need to do? You know, and it's like, yeah, I did it. I enjoyed doing it. I mean, my favorite day of the year was Night of Champions Day. That was, you know, that was my baby, mine and Charlie's Very baby. Obvious. And, you know, that show, the, the Olympiad was big. You had to deal with so much and this and that. And it was big. It was satisfying, but it was big. But Night of Champions was that morning. I could never sleep the night before. I wouldn't stay at the hotel. I'd sleep home because it was so close. And I'd get up like at 4 in the morning and this and that. I couldn't wait to get there. And the truck would come at 7.30. And the union guys would open the door at 8. And they'd let us unload the truck because I'd buy them breakfast. Because they're getting paid for it. They didn't have to work. And they're eating. And they're letting us do the work so we could have better staging. Because I had, you know, 20 guys would show up that would work. It was always so much fun. And then... The, Wayne, the, just to tell you this. If we go two minutes longer, my guy's not going to be able to see his girl tonight. Okay? He's got to go see his girl tonight. How old is your girl? He, he's got a lot of them because he's a Tinder expert. He's, he's a complete, he's a, he's a, I don't know if you're familiar he with ain't my league. Tinder. I could tell you that. If, he ain't if, my league if, if I show you what I got. If, if, you, if, you, if you're a Tinder expert like he is, he's always <laughs> nah, set up. What will so, I do with that? But wait. I'll come back anytime you yeah, want. Yeah, I mean, I'm telling you. I, I'm telling you, I really enjoyed this conversation. There was a lot of depth in this. Appreciate you for coming out, man. Thank you. Really. Wayne can tell stories. So, I mean, if I would have let him, we would have gone for another two, three hours, but we all had places to go to. But it was still amazing to hear the stories and his passion for the love of bodybuilding and promoting that one part about the 10 things I was able to get out of him on what makes a great promoter. You see a lot of similarities between that world, Dana White, you know, Don King, different styles, but still a lot to learn from there. But if you enjoyed this interview and you're into the bodybuilding world and you made it all the way to the end, I'm assuming you love bodybuilding. There's two other ones I want you to watch. One of them is uh, Sean Ray, which led to us wanting to do this. So if you've not watched this one, click over here to watch Sean Ray's interview. If you watch that, there's another one I want you to watch by Dorian Yates which is absolutely interesting as well. Click on either one of them. If you've not subscribed to the channel, please do so. Thanks for watching, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.